And with that, I would like to introduce Susan Knight from the Trout Lake Research Station. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. What a beautiful turnout. Uh, I know you're just hiding from mosquitoes, though. Um, yeah, my name is Susan Knight. I work at the UW Trout Lake Station. Tonight, we have a distinguished panel of experts exploring the geology, engineering, economics, environment, and regulation of mining in the Pinocchio Range. This forum is brought to you by our Science on Tap sponsors, you know them well, the Manaqua Public Library, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, and UW Trout Lake Station. And before we start, I would also like to thank our financial sponsors. They include the UW Madison Office of University Relations Statewide Outreach Incentive Grant Program, the UW Madison Speakers Bureau, and the UW Madison College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Thanks very much to them for their financial support. By the yes, thank you. This event is being uh, recorded. It is not being live streamed, but uh, it will be available on our Science on Tap website. Uh, later on this month, so you can come back and go and look for it there. Now, it is an honor for me to introduce our forum moderator, Mr. Larry Konopaki. Mr. Konopaki is Senior Staff Attorney with the Wisconsin Legislative Council staff. Responsibilities of the, res of the council staff include providing nonpartisan, legal, scientific, and other research services to the state legislature among other duties. Larry himself specializes in natural resources, the environment, agriculture, local government, energy, utilities, and other issue areas. During the 2013-2014 legislative session, Larry was one of the council staff assigned to the legislative committees that handled the recent ferrous mining legislation. So Mr. Konopaki is eminently qualified and well-versed on these topics. Mr. Konopaki is going to introduce our panelists and preside over the forum. Thank you, Mr. Konopaki. Thank you, Susan. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's very um, heartening to see so many faces that have bec become familiar over the last few years to some of us who have been involved in the mining issue. Uh, I've, I actually got here fairly late, uh, due to the, in part at least to the uh, to the traffic difficulties south of town. But in the short time I was here, I saw at least 25 people that I recognize from uh, the many hearings and many discussions and forums that have been on mining over the last few years. Uh, thank you. Okay. The uh, the goal of this forum, of the organizers of the forum, is to, is to provide an opportunity for people to gather the information that they need to better understand ferrous mining and to form their opinions. Um, not to, unfortunately we don't have time to allow people an opportunity to, to express their opinions. We're going to try to work through this uh, fairly rigorous schedule to get as much information in your hands as we can about this topic. There are resources available to any of you who are looking to, um, to add to your learning on this topic. The DNR's webpage has a significant amount of information about the potential mining project in Ashland and Iron Counties. If you go, I, I actually tried this in the last day. You almost can't miss this information on their website. If you can get to the DNR website, you can search for mining, the word Ferris, uh, Pinocchi's, Gogebic, anything, it'll get you to their site and they've got a, a wealth of information there to share with you about the process that this company is going through and the exploration that's occurring on that site. If you have, uh, if, if you're interested in more information on the recent Ferris mining legislation, you can go to the website of, of my office, the Legislative Council staff, and we have informational memoranda on that site that explain the changes in the law that were made in Act One of this session. 
The speakers are each going to be given 12 minutes to make their remarks approximately. Followed, when we're done with all of the speakers, we'll take a short break. After that time, the speakers are going to field questions from you. If you would like to submit a question for the speakers to address, you'll note that there was a card laid on your seat when you arrived. You can write that card and hand it to any of the uh, event organizers and we'll forward those questions as many as we have time for on to the panel for, for their, uh, their answers. We've already been, um, we've already talked about silencing cell phones. If you could also please move your conversations outside the back room if you feel the need to have them. Um, and please respect the speakers and other attendees who may have differing, differing opinions from what you do. Um, it's a goal of this forum to create an environment that's, that is going to make it a comfortable environment for everyone here to learn. And to that end, we would ask that you please do not applaud, boo, or make any other outward expressions of support or disapproval uh, of any of the speaker comments. Thank you again for being here and for contributing to what we hope to be a very productive and respectful forum. And with that, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, who is Tom Fitz from Northland College, who will be talking about the geology of the Pinocchis. Help, join me in welcoming Tom, thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, the layers of bedrock in the Western Lake Superior region have been folded up into a great big U-shape, kind of like a canoe, all right, with the oldest rocks on the outside and the youngest rocks on the inside in here. And kind of on the gunnels of this canoe are these fascinating rocks called iron formations, such as the great big Masabi Range in Minnesota, where the majority of our iron ore in the United States comes from. Um, over in the Marquette Range, there are two active mines. And then the big one down here that we're talking about tonight is the Gogebic slash Pinocchi Range. Um, the range, it's the same range of mountains and it's the same bedrock geology that goes from Wisconsin into Michigan. Um, over here in um, Wisconsin, we call it the Pinocchies, and uh, commonly in Michigan, it's called the uh, Gogebic Range. Okay, so in the Pinocchi Gogebic Range, the iron formation is called the Ironwood Iron Formation, and it extends, this is, represents it here on uh, the red line, and it extends from uh, southern Bayfield County, about 75 miles over into Michigan, um, to near Lake Gogebic. Okay, it's a very hard rock. It is composed of minerals that are very resistant to weathering. So what happens is that it has stood up high in comparison to the surrounding bedrock units during erosion. And as a result, it forms a big ridge, the Pinocchi Ridge. This is, I took this picture from Copper Falls State Park from the tower there, looking south. And that's Mount Whittlesley right there. And the whole ridge along here is held up by the uh, very hard, ironwood iron formation okay this is a bedrock geologic map of the area okay with sort of the the gunnels of the canoe with all the layers tipped up um, they they dip to the north okay is what we say so what we're seeing is the edge of the formations the youngest ones are up here the oldest ones are down here and the iron formation the ironwood iron formation is that red layer right in there the area we're talking about tonight okay there's melon right there the area we're talking about tonight is in this stretch right here Okay, so if we take a slice across the Pinocchi Range, going from south to north, okay, here's the big bedrock ridge there, so the iron formation is, holds the backbone of the Pinocchi Range. And what I'd like to do is go through these three formations right here. This one is called the Palms Formation, this is the Ironwood Formation, and this is the Tyler Formation. So we'll go through those quickly. Okay, first is the Palms Formation uh, at the bottom of this sequence, and the Palms, for, you can see 
see that the angle here, okay, off of the horizontal, those, the layers dip 65 degrees to the north. Okay, that's important for the mine geometry. Um, okay, so the, this formation, the Palms Formation, is primarily a quartzite, so it's a hard rock. It's mostly quartz, and it's got interbedded slate in there as well. Above that is the ironwood, iron formation, which is composed of magnetite and quartz primarily, all right, and the proportion of magnetite in quartz varies from place to place, uh, vertically and horizontally, and um, it's the magnetite that has the iron in it, and so the grade of the ore, the quantity of magnetite and the grade of the ore varies from place to place as well, okay. There are other minor minerals in the ironwood as well, okay, there is some pyrite and there is, um, this is siderite, the pyrite is iron sulfide and this is iron carbonate, um, those are minor amounts in the iron formation as well. There is also, in some areas, there are um, layers of amphibole rich uh, rock and um, the amphiboles is a whole big group of minerals and um, this one, whoops, that one is um, the mineral grunerite in that layer anyway. There, there may be other uh, amphibole minerals in there as well. Okay, and then above the ironwood formation is the Tyler formation, which the bottom of the Tyler formation, where it's near in contact with the ironwood, is uh, primarily a black slate, right? And it also, whoops, it also has some pyrite in it as well. Okay, so this is another uh, cross-section, geologic cross-section from United States Geological Survey, all right, with the three formations, the Palms, the Ironwood, and the Tyler Formation all dipping off to the north. Okay, and all of these bedrock units are overlain by glacial deposits uh, that vary from anywhere from uh, zero to maybe about 100 feet thick of a mixture of sand, uh, silt, and cobbles and boulders, uh, some pebbles in there too. And what that means is that with that mix, it sort of has a medium permeability, which means groundwater moves through it sort of a medium rate, okay, which could be important. Right. Okay, so the iron formations are fascinating rocks, <laughs> geologically speaking, because um, they're all about the same age. All right, they're all, they were all deposited about two billion years ago uh, at a time when Earth was very different, and it probably had to do with the first abundant free oxygen in the atmosphere as a result of the first abundant photosynthesis, and that oxygen in the atmosphere actually reacting with dissolved iron in the water to be precipitated out on the, sh the floors of shallow oceans around the world in these layers of magnetite and quartz and these remarkable deposits and um, they're there are, they only occur in that time interval and they haven't been deposited in that scale ever since. So it was just a special time in Earth's history. These rocks are also of great interest because of their, um, because of the iron resource. Uh, all of our iron comes from iron formations. In the United States, we use about 50 million tons of iron ore per year. And iron is used in making steel, and anything that is big and strong, big durable goods are mostly made of steel. So it's an important resource in our society and has been for a long time. Okay. All right. So the, and there is a lot of iron in the ironwood iron formation, okay? It's been estimated that the stretch from uh, Mineral Lake, just west of Mellon, to Upson, which is over here, this stretch contains um, approximately 3.7 billion tons of iron, of economic iron ore. All right, so there's a lot of it in there and it could play an important role in the iron industry in the future. All right, um, the area has had mines. There was active mining, underground mining from 1887 to 1967. And the mining in that time was done by underground mining techniques and the miners were just going after the h deposits of high grade ore. And in that time period, 325 million tons of iron ore was shipped from the Pinocchio Gogebic range. Okay, uh, times have changed and the modern mining techniques um, are such that uh, open pit mining is now used in iron mining. Um, and so it isn't just the high grade deposits, um, now it is profitable to go after uh, taconite, which isn't the um, 
doesn't have the grade of the old ores. Okay, so if a mine were to be put in in the um, Pinocchi range, it could look something like this. This is the iron formation coming across here like this. This is the big Pinocchi ridge. Uh, Mellon is over about here. Okay, Upson's over that way. And uh, this is um, a stretch about four and a half miles long. All right, and about um, half a mile wide, something like that. All right, so um, the ironwood formation, not all of the rock in there is of economic value, so some of it would end up as waste rock. And then the pit wall on the south would have to be laid down at an angle less than 65 degrees, so there'd be some waste rock from the palms formation as well. And then to access the lower parts of the ironwood, uh, some of the tiler formation would also have to come out, and those rocks would end up in the waste rock pile. Okay, some of which would, may end up back in the pit as well. Okay, so there would be uh, the impacts at the site from the, from the excavation of the mine right there. Okay, well, also what we're interested in is um, impacts away from the site, and so we're interested in air and water and how that moves off the site. Okay, so the, the area is in within the Bad River watershed, which is shown here. Okay, that's a Bad River watershed. Here's the iron formation right across there like that. And so the water coming down as precipitation is drained um, through rivers that go off to the north, including the Tyler Forks River, and through the Bad River that comes down around like that, okay? And um, tributaries that flow into those. All right, so right at the site, all right, the area in the east is drained by Bull Gus Creek and Tyler Forks River, which goes up here and then around and eventually goes into the Bad River at Copper Falls State Park. And the west end is drained by Devil's Creek and Balu Creek primarily, and those flow into the Bad River over, uh, over at Mellon. So those are the creeks that uh, could be affected by um, a mine and changes in the drainage pattern um, because of mining. We also have to think about groundwater and groundwater flow because, of course, uh, a lot of the water flows off of the, not off of the land, but through the land as groundwater. So we have to think about how groundwater flow would be affected as well, right? And it is likely that the permeability of the rock is greater parallel to the fractures than across the fractures, so probably, and what would happen is that the mine would have to be dewatered, which means that there would be um, pumps that would take water out of the pit, and um, so the water table would be drawn down, and the water table would probably be drawn down greater east-west than north-south because of the permeability along the fractures like that. <clears throat> okay. All right, in terms of impacts from the mineralogy of the site, the, most of the ironwood formation is, as we mentioned, it is magnetite and quartz, okay, which are um, insoluble and don't add ions to the water. But um, the pyrite, um, when it is ground up, it's brought to the surface and it's in contact with air and water, um, can break down and put ions into the water, which can flow down gradient, um, ions such as uh, sulfate, and that can affect habitat down gradient. All right, the other, um, another concern from mineralogy is the amphibole that I mentioned. All right, and the amphibole, again, it varies from place to place. It isn't everywhere. Um, in some places, it is quite abundant. And the issue with the amphibole minerals is that they can be, and they are at this location, they can be elongate fibers. They can be asbestiform or asbestos minerals and asbestos-like minerals. And um, as a result, can be a uh, respiratory hazard for people uh, working in the area that inhale these, these fibers. Okay, and I think that I will leave it there. Thank you, Tom. Next, we have Steve Donahue from Foth and Van Dyke, who is going to talk to us about the process of metallic surface mining. Welcome, Steve. Uh, thank you. I'm excited to be here and talk about this topic. I was given, I think, 12 minutes to talk about the process of mining. So uh, it's going to be a little challenging. What I'll try to do is 
give you a little bit of a perspective as to what type of a process a mining company goes through to uh, develop a project. Uh, the different elements of a mining operation give you some perspective as uh, based on photos and things like that from iron operations. I've also uh, laced into the uh, presentation some photos from other types of metallic mining operations. It's certainly a topic that's discussed here in Wisconsin. So you'll see stuff here from iron and copper and things like that as we're going through the presentation. I've tried to keep it a little simple. Uh, so that folks, uh, you know, can grasp what, what, what we're actually talking about when, when we uh, uh, develop a mining operation here. Uh, the stages of mine development. Um, the development of a mine is actually a very intensive process. Uh, it incorporates a lot of engineering talent, civil engineers, geotechnical engineers, mine engineers, economists. Uh, bankers, uh, geoscientists, geologists, geochemists, etc., all evaluating these deposits. And it starts out through geological surveys to try to identify where resources are, uh, then goes through exploration, which could be drilling holes in the ground, things of that nature. And then eventually, if a resource uh, actually, someone discovers something of economic value, that's called a discovery, and that's delineated to define how big the resource is, what the economic value of it is potentially. And then you get into a development stage, and that's really the stage that this project uh, is in, uh, in that we're talking about here. And eventually you get into production and reclamation. So we're going to talk a little bit about development, and then we're going to give you some examples of what's actually going on in these operations. Uh, during development, typically what a mining company is doing is very detailed engineering studies on the mining operation. A lot of different facets that uh, are being examined beginning, if it's a surface mine, how is that mine going to be designed? What's the most economical way of getting the material out of the ground? How are we going to do that in a manner that's also protective of the environment? That's always being examined by mining companies as they're going through this. The metallurgical process, how are we going to get the metal out of the rock? It involves grinding and other metallurgical processes to get the product out. The infrastructure that's required to do this, there's a lot of infrastructure that goes into developing one of these operations, and we'll touch on that a little bit. And then finally and importantly, eventually the mine will come to an end, and we got to think about reclamation, so that's also looked at at a very early stage in these projects. And then finally, as a mining company is going through this, uh, they're looking at environmental studies, permitting requirements, all that type of stuff. So it's a very labor-intensive effort that a mining company commits to when they get into one of these things. Uh, common infrastructure that's associated with the mining operation. First of all, you got to get materials into the operation, so you're talking about roads and rail uh, to bring material and equipment in and to bring material and equipment out. Uh, there's going to be a mill facility, which will consist of crushers and grinding equipment and other equipment to separate the metal from the ore. Uh, warehouse buildings, uh, maintenance buildings, office buildings, water treatment plant. There will be water that's going to have to be managed, and if any water has to be discharged back into the environment, by law, that water has to be treated and meet certain standards before it can be released back into the environment. So any modern mining operation is probably going to have a water treatment plant. Uh, there's going to be waste materials, the tailings in the waste rock. Uh, we heard about the waste rock before. Once that ore is ground and the metal is separated, that waste material referred to as the tailings has to go somewhere. So that facility has to be designed and engineered and operated in a way that's going to be protective of the environment. I believe you're going to hear Craig Benson talk a little bit about that uh, uh, later on. Also, there's going to be an electrical power supply. It could be an on-site generator. It could be electricity that's brought in via power lines. Uh, there's going to be a water supply system, laboratories, and other things. It's a pretty big operation that goes into developing one of these. Uh, each element of the operation is highly regulated. Uh, construction uh, that affects navigable waterways and wetlands is regulated. Uh, air emissions from the project is regulated. Uh, stormwater runoff from the project is regulated. Wastewater treatment, as I mentioned prior to discharge, is regulated. Uh, the design of the mine waste storage facilities is regulated. Uh, the reclaimed mine site is regulated. And groundwater and surface water monitoring, which are mandatory elements of the projects, uh, are regulated and, and uh, 
thoroughly reviewed uh, by the regulatory agencies as part of the annual reports that the mining companies submit to the regulatory agencies. Here we've got a schematic of what an operation might look like. Um, so we've got an open pit here. We've got maybe some groundwater and other precipitation that's coming into the pit. We've got pumps that are pumping the water maybe to a central water storage basin. We've got an ore processing and milling facility here. We've got a stockpile that's feeding the mill. That's generating the, the, uh, the uh, uh, ore that's going into the uh, separation process to generate, in this case, taconite pellets that would be loaded out most likely onto rail cars and shipped out. Uh, then we're going to have a tails and waste rock storage facility. We're going to have trucks coming in and out. We may have a truck wash. Some mines, you know, have truck washes before uh, any truck leaves the site. They're, they're washed. And then we're going to have probably a water treatment facility. Um, another common concern with projects like this is air quality. Uh, air quality, again, is something that's highly regulated in these operations through uh, fugitive control processes. Uh, you can see here uh, during the operation, there's oftentimes in the pit water trucks that are being used to suppress dust. That's going on basically anywhere in the surface operations. Uh, there's bag houses in the, uh, in the mill facility, which are basically big vacuums that are uh, filtering the air collecting the particulates so that anything that's emitted from the mine site is complying with air quality standards. That's also occurring commonly with the tailings and waste rock facility as well. Uh, typical project starts with blasting. So I've got a picture here of a blasting operation. This is a highly engineered process, very controlled. Um, I threw a, a picture in here for levity purposes. Uh, you're not going to see big boulders flying through the air that are going to you know, land on Uncle Bob or anything like that. Um, uh, blasting material costs money, and so typically there's blast engineers who specialize in tailoring the blast so that only the required amount of blasting agent is used just to loosen the rock up so that they can get in there and excavate that material. Uh, then we get into a loading process where the ore is typically loaded into a, uh, a haul truck and that haul truck then hauls it up to a central uh, spot where the grinding process and the breaking down of the rock and the ore starts. Uh, here we've got a haul truck dumping into a primary crusher. Uh, so these are large trucks. Uh, you see it dumping into the primary crusher here and some of this equipment is fairly large. So uh, just for scale purposes, we've got some individual standing next to that uh, uh, primary crusher there where the ore starts to go through its initial uh, grinding to break down that rock into small particles. Uh, then we get inside the mill and we uh, see other crushing equipment. Uh, in the case of a taconite operation, uh, we're looking at a fine crushing operation here where the crushed taconite containing the iron is offloaded. Uh, from trains or trucks pass through a series of crushers and tumbling devices that grind the pieces into a fine powder. Uh, then uh, the rich concentrate from the separator is rolled, is mixed with uh, a binding agent, typically like a bentonite, and it's rolled into a, a small uh, kind of pebbles, almost like a small marble. They're about that big, uh, these little pellets, and uh, uh, then they're uh, pass through essentially a kiln to heat them up at a high temperature and bind them so that they become hard and they, they withstand, uh, withstand transportation from the mill to the actual steel mill via rail or however they're being shipped. Here we see uh, inside a plant where these pellets are on a large conveyor and they're going through the heating process or the heat, uh, heating and hardening. Uh, this is a large copper operation uh, down in southern Peru, and mines use different types of infrastructure to get the ore out of the mine. Here we see a large open pit copper operation. We actually have a rail facility coming into the mine. The large trucks down the bottom are dumping the ore into a central collection point here. The train comes up, a lot of rail cars, takes the ore, rides it up to the mill. 
A lot of our copper that we use in the U.S. today is actually coming from mines like this down in Southern America. Uh, mill tailings management, uh, uh, Craig is going to talk a little bit about this, but there's different technologies that are used for tailings management. Uh, here we've got a tailings thickener, so the tailings coming out of the uh, uh, mill are in a large tank. The water is start to pulled off of them by adding various reagents to the uh, uh, water to uh, depress the tailings, uh, remove the water. In some instances, uh, the tailings are run through filter presses or other things to remove the water, and that tailings is then hauled to a, uh, uh, um, a central tailings facility. Uh, this is from an operation up in Alaska. Uh, this is a uh, zinc mine. Uh, so here we see the uh, filtered tailings being loaded into trucks and then hauled down into a central tailings facility, much the way a modern landfill operation might operate. Uh, here we see the tailings being pressed into, uh, into the facility. In this, in this instance, uh, this is a line facility. Um, here we see a, a wastewater storage lagoon being constructed. Uh, this happens to be over in northern Mongolia. Uh, and this is for uh, water storage purposes at this particular mining operation. That's an HDPE liner that's being installed down there. Um, we actually, on this particular project, had the opportunity to also visit a mine camp, an exploration camp, south of the Siberian border where they house you in yurts. Um, and uh, treated us to lunch in these yurts where they served us Mongolian sushi, which in Mongolia is raw bacon on a slice of uh, rye, bre rye bread. Uh, they don't have Mongolian beef like over there like you see in the Chinese restaurants. Um, but anyways, uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea as to what's going on in a mining operation. Um, and I think that's the last slide that I had. Thanks, Steve. Next, we have Nick Parker from the UW-Madison talking about the economic impacts of mining. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm relatively new to Wisconsin. And the perspective I bring is mostly the perspective of an uh, economist who studies natural resource use. I have a bit of a, a, a personal interaction with mining as I've lived in areas of Michigan and Montana uh, where there was lots of mining going on nearby. Um, so I call my talk, Local Economic Impacts of Mining, Thoughts from a Two-Handed Economist. And that title is in deference to Harry Truman who in frustration um, in asking his economic advisors for policy advice finally said, give me a one-handed economist. All my economists say on one hand and on the other. And, and so my, my, my title is in deference to, to Truman and I am a, a two-handed economist and it's quite hard to be anything other than a two-handed economist. And, Maybe, maybe if we start with a simple dichotomy here, um, the, the economist in training who, you know, has it right, he's thinking of both hands, um, but uh, only very simply might say, well, on one hand, mining creates jobs, it brings in revenue, but on the other hand, mining, it's bad for the environment and it disturbs the quality of life. So this is the economist in training. And the more advanced and also nerdier economist um, could work in some subtleties here. And these are the subtleties I want to talk about for the next 11 and a half minutes or so. Um, uh, so within that umbrella of this, this, on one hand, mining creates jobs and revenues. Um, the, the, the subtle thought is, well, it depends on how big the multipliers are. And yes, this is generally true, but how many jobs depends a lot on context. Uh, there's a second point there, a caveat, which is, you know, mining jobs can be volatile in the long run. We'll talk a bit about that. And it's also possible, uh, at least theoretically and in practice it happens sometimes, that mining can crowd out some other economic sectors. 
that also create jobs, uh, especially those sectors that leverage natural amenities um, as an input in their production. And then on the other side, of course, it's, it's much too simple to say, well, mining despoils the environment and quality of life. You know, we're, we're talking about a modern regulated setting where, um, where there's lots of uh, regulations that check behavior. Moreover, mining um, revenues are, are taxed, and that tax revenue um, is reinvested sometimes in environmental quality, but almost always in community infrastructure. So you can see that these trade-offs are, of course, not very simple, and these are the, the subtleties I want to address and put a little more substance behind in the next few minutes. So on this issue of multiplier effects, just a brief introduction to the concept, which is the idea that a new job in natural resources or in mining um, and these are, these are well-paid jobs, someone who lives locally and works in the industry, and that job is going to be associated with the operation spending more on its inputs, supplies, transportation, and also the employees are going to spend on food, clothing, entertainment, the spending is often and usually going to be local, and so the effect of one job becomes more than one job, it multiplies and you tend to, to get more jobs in, say, the transportation sector, the construction, the wholesale sectors, services, retails. These, this is the idea of the multiplier effect, and, and, and this is what happens when you bring in a new mining job. Um, I'll skip over an example from some of my research, but so in preparing this talk, I, I tried to look into the academic peer-reviewed literature in economics to say, what, what is the size of these multiplier effects? And I will say the literature is actually quite thin in terms of papers that actually have been reviewed by independent anonymous um, reviewers and made it through that process and been published. Um, I couldn't find anything in my search about uh, uh, the multiplier effects of a specific iron ore mine. But I found some recent papers, one about the coal boom in Ash Appalachia, and the estimate there is that 10 new mining jobs during the coal boom of the 70s and 80s created about two new jobs in uh, services and retail. These are jobs local, not, not national or statewide, but local jobs. Uh, the oil boom in, in Canada, there's been a couple one from 1996 to 2006 that was studied pretty extensively. And the multiplier effect from that boom is estimated to be a lot bigger. For every 10 new jobs in um, oil and gas, uh, the, the economists estimated 13 new jobs in services and retail, et cetera. And then these are related to multiplier effects of manufacturing in general, which a recent study uh, estimated uh, about 25 new jobs for every 10 jobs, local jobs in manufacturing. There's also a big, what I would call gray literature, literature that hasn't been peer reviewed, um, that tries to forecast what the multiplier effects would be of metal mine openings, a copper mine in Arizona, uh, uh, taconite mines in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And when I read those, they're forecasts, so they're different than the studies I just talked about because they're estimating what will happen. The studies I talked about estimated what did happen, um, but the forecasted multipliers tend to be much larger than what I showed, and so it does beg the question of why. Why would these multiplier effects be larger? And I will say I didn't scrutinize all of these studies. I, I can offer some potential reasons. One is uh, taconite mining is different. There's more upfront capital investments that can lead to more construction at the beginning, which can have bigger multiplier effects. Um, it's also true from what I browsed in these studies is that, by definition, the studies in the estimates of multipliers don't allow any crowding out of mining on another sector. So they're sort of constructed to generate positive effects. So. Um, you know, when you're thinking about multiplier effects, it's important to compare projections with um, studies of what has actually happened. The second issue I want to talk about, those are short-run multiplier effect estimators. But if we think about the long run, and we're talking about mining, 
I think an issue that we have to confront is the volatility of the industry. Now, this is not to say that mining is the only volatile industry or sector. Lots of sectors are volatile. But mining does have this um, history of, of booms and busts. And the profitability of mining operations in the long run are certainly related quite directly to the international price of the minerals that are being extracted. And so what I show here is inflation adjusted time series of international prices per ton of iron ore since 1900 from the USGS. And I think this image, this graph demonstrates volatility. Prices were quite high in the early 80s, they plummeted um, into the early 2000s and then ramped up from about 2000 to 2012. And this is when my understanding is that the, the mining plan in the Gogebic, the um, Pinocchio Hills kind of started, started showing up in the news and when the plans were being put forth is at this peak price. Well, if you look at just what happened even in that three year period, since 2011 and the present, the world price of iron ore has been halved. So it's a very, very dramatic change. And this is important because if we're thinking about mining as an economic engine, we have to think about what's going to happen in the longer run and what conditions might cause a mine to be shut down. On June 3rd, there was a report in the mining.com uh, website um, where there's a spokesman says if prices go below $80, and right here what I show is close to 100, uh, a lot of miners will disappear. And then in a USGS 2014 report that I've highlighted here, it, there's a discussion about production lines in Minnesota uh, and closures in the Empire Mine, not closures, temporary idling of the mine. So the point is just to say that there's forces that are, that are non-local that affect the profitability of mining and it makes that industry somewhat volatile. Something to think about. Um, an example from my own research is a colleague and I studied the 1970s and 1980s oil boom and bust in the US West. And that boom and bust was triggered by a big ramp up in the international price of oil circa 1974, and then a crash in about 1985. And so the dark counties, the shaded dark counties in, um, in the map are counties that experienced this boom bust, counties that had big endowments of oil and had a big influx of oil development and drilling during that boom period. And so what we did is we tracked their economic outcomes and we compared them to neighboring counties that didn't have oil and gas to try to estimate the impacts of this boom bust cycle on the economies. And what we found was in part not surprising and in part surprising to us. If you focus on the per capita income graph, which is uh, I guess um, on your right, uh, you see that the dark line, which is the counties that had oil and gas that boomed and bust, they their per capita income grew relative to the non-oil counties on average pretty significantly during the boom period. But what is surprising is what happened after the bust, and that is there was a reversal of fortune. The counties that had the oil and gas fell below in per capita income, which may not surprise you that initially that happened, but what was surprising to us is that these disparities in per capita income persisted for 15 years after the bust, which means that in the longer run, uh, you know, you need to consider the drawbacks of specializing in a volatile industry. With that being said, I looked at mining jobs by county in the area and compared them to total jobs, at least in terms of 2007 data. And I don't think the opening of a mine here in northern Wisconsin puts at risk the counties of being over-specialized in mining. Um, in fact, 
a good economic development strategy is also is often diversifying your economic base and in this case diversification would be more mining since there isn't much now so I wanted to make that point clear how much more time do I have my okay um, so the the third point I wanted to talk about um, is this in terms of this list of nuances that I think are important to think about when you're thinking about the economic trade-offs is this question of could mining slow or reverse growth in other economic sectors so there's there's actually a pretty big literature in economics about sometimes it's called the Dutch disease with respect to natural resource economics or the natural resource curse where there's there's some evidence that mining and natural resources in some setting can crowd out manufacturing it can crowd out agriculture I don't want to talk about that because I doubt it's important in this setting but one thing I wanted to raise attention to is the question of you know what what could the impacts of mining be on on tourism recreation and amenity dependent businesses it's plausible that um, these industries which rely on beautiful landscapes as an input um, could 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 see slower growth if they're next door to a mine the the the, the letter the letter that I've posted here is an excerpt from a letter signed by 200 economists to President Barack Obama back in 2011 it makes this point I think pretty clearly uh, and it's a controversial point and there's counterpoints to it but I want to read a few points from the letter uh, it, and it's in the context of conserving public land in the US West but I think the I think the general themes apply apply here so the letter says dear mr. president the rivers lakes found on public lands have helped transform the Western economy from a dependence on resource extraction industries to growth from in migration tourism and modern economy sectors such as finance engineering software development and healthcare increasingly entrepreneurs are basing their business decisions on the quality of life in an area businesses are recruiting ta talented employees by promoting access to beautiful nearby public lands studies have repeatedly shown that protected public lands are significant contributors to economic growth this is signed by 200 economists some of them Nobel laureates so it's not it's not crazy talk but it, it you know the impact of natural amenities on economies of course depends on on local conditions which which vary and not every not every place is next to glacier national park that that's certain so the final the final point i want to make is to speak to the potential value of having a mining industry plus environmental quality and the last speaker talked about the regulations that that help make that true that you can have mining jobs and environmental quality which is like a win-win and to make to make this point I want to point to some recent economic estimates from Pennsylvania and they pertain to natural gas fracking in Pennsylvania and the effect of fracking on nearby pop property values so w what the researchers did their economists is they compared the impact of natural gas development on nearby property values and they drew a contrast between property that is on the public water supply piped water and properties that are on well water and the reason for making this contrast is the perception is that fracking risk contaminating groundwater and that risk is much higher if you're on well water and what they found is that the 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 boom the natural gas boom had a positive impact on properties that were on public water supplies 10.7 percent a big increase and that's presumably a response to the economic boom and the value of that that gets capitalized into property however if you were on well water there was an offsetting negative effect and that negative effect outweighed the positive effect to the tune of you know a decrease in property values of about 13 percent so the point here is if you get in a situation where you can have the boom and the jobs without the perception and the risk of contamination and decreased environmental quality then you can have this kind of win-win 
so that those are the main points I want to raise. I I I, I want to say that you know in thinking about policy, the big guiding principle in economics is, and I think maybe broader than economics is, you know, those who bear the benefits, who accrue the benefits of a mining project should be the ones that bear the costs. And I think that's what regulation is intended to do and that's what environmental legal liability is intended to do. And if you can have that principle kind of disciplined behavior, you can work towards a situation where you have jobs and the or jobs and the environment rather than jobs or the environment. So my, my concluding on one hand and on the other is that mining can be a catalyst for economic growth, especially when it can coexist with natural amenities. Uh, and greater economic value in some cases is generated by leaving landscapes in their natural state. It it's, depends on local conditions. Thank you very much, Nick. Next we have Cyrus Hester from the Bad River Tribe of the Lake Superior Chippewa to speak with us about environmental issues related to the proposed mine. Welcome. Bring this back down here. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've been asked to talk about the environmental aspects of mining in the headwaters of the Bad River. Um, thank you, okay, better? Don't often have to raise the mic. All right. Um, so I want to have two caveats up front. One is I'm going to focus a lot on the aquatic environment, uh, and that's really just in, uh, in the interest of time. Um, if folks are interested in potential impacts or effects on the air environment or other issues, um, I'd encourage you to submit co uh, questions later. The other thing is uh, I'm basing this a lot on the ecology and hydrology of the Bad River watershed and uh, projects that have taken place in the basin. Uh, and mining in general. So I'm not making predictions about any particular project. Um, but this is a, so moving on, uh, this is a map of the Bad River watershed. I think Tom presented this earlier. It's about a thousand square miles um, of highland forests, springs and seeps, wetlands, uh, and, a, um, and a few lakes that feed into a majority of cold water fisheries um, that have a role in the overall function and uh, ecological functioning character of the broader watershed. Uh, about five main rivers flow through the system. All, uh, all of them flow on into the Bad River, through the Bad River Reservation, through the Bad River Cacogan Sluice Complex. These host the largest natural uh, remaining beds of uh, wild rice in the Great Lakes area and are also wetlands recognized as international importance under the Ramsar Convention. Um, but perhaps most significantly, they're, they're called home to generations of folks that have uh, used that as part of their uh, community as part of their way of life in the harvest of that, that uh, rice. Um, so the principal, well, let me just back up. The principal sub-watersheds we're talking about are the Tyler Forks and the Upper Bad, where the phase one project area is located. Um, moving back to the water, watershed, and I mentioned the, the sloughs. Uh, waterways have made this home not just for tribal members, but for non-tribal communities. And that's because of the natural assets and ecosystem services that are provided by this working landscape, uh, both in an ecological, social, and in an economic sense. They provide uh, water for agriculture, um, for wild rice production and harvest, for fishing, um, and for travel and recreation and those types of things. Um, so these, this the system is providing um, a number of benefits, and it's all connected. And we can think about this by dividing a, general, a watershed into three general categories or regions. The, uh, the headwaters tend to be considered the zone of erosion. This is where materials and nutrients are transported with fairly steep gradient streams. They move through the zone that's called the transport zone, where things are mobilized through towards the flatter, more gradual sloping areas called the long-term long -term storage or depositional area. This is the reason why there are so many wetlands in that area, because of that de deposition of material, because of that fairly low topographic relief. Um, but the focus is in the headwaters, where the project is proposed. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the ecology in that area, um, in the proposed project area. It's, uh, focusing first on headwater forests and their role. 
Uh, so headwater forests provide stability. Their roots stabilize soil and prevent erosion. Uh, the branches and trunks and other things create, the forests in general create habitat, sometimes for game species, for many non-game species as well. Shade also maintains the stable temperatures that are critical for cold water fisheries communities and influences the thermal regime throughout the watershed. And then of course the, the landscape, um, flora and fauna provide nutrients to that system. And that fine organic material is brought throughout the system uh, and affects ecological and aquatic communities downstream. Wetlands are also a key feature in the headwaters. Um, they store flood, flood waters, and this is a neat one. This is at the head, head, headwaters of Bulgus Creek. I don't know if you can see this, but this is, um, this is behind a beaver dam, and that's about 10 feet of, uh, of storage capacity in that beaver dam. So that's a lot of water that's being held back and slowly seeped out. And that can be important because that more gradual flow, release of, uh, of water, um, maintains flow and temperature, especially towards in the warmer months of the year when it gets warm and the water levels get low, and that's critical for some cold water fisheries like brook trout in the area. Wetlands also act, also act as a filtration system, filtering out pollutants and sediment, um, and again, recharging nutrients and also providing habitat. So when we talk about mining, um, at the very least, we're talking about a large-scale change that really doesn't have a very good natural analog. There's not an, an equal in, in nature of this kind of scale and intensity. Um, it's, it's important to recognize that we're talking about a priority of values when we make decisions to do this. And I don't mean this in a moral sense. I simply mean that the landscapes provide a value. In one sense, it could be an economic in the production of taconite, potential jobs like Dr. Parker talked about. Um, in the other sense, the landscape is currently providing a number of services that are more of a non-market value, all the things I just talked about. And when we talk about a project, and particularly the environmental effects, there are direct Im impacts that are um, really unavoidable. Uh, they can be mitigated, the footprint can be changed, but there's some impacts that come with the business of mining. Things that result from the extraction of, of uh, material, from the draining, the dewatering, from the sto uh, storing of waste on the landscape. And then there are indirect impacts, things like runoff, which are less certain um, and more variable. And so um, the direct impacts uh, are regulated, absolutely, um, when they're predicted, when they're understood, um, but they're largely permissible. They're accepted as part of doing business. The indirect impacts, um, things like runoff, things like water quality, bring with them more nuance and complexity. Um, Examples of potential indirect impacts are erosion from disturbed areas, increased sedimentation, uh, and the loading of metals. And we've got a couple of things here, as you can see. And, and metals and sediment can tend to go together when they absorb onto the surface of sediment and mobilize downstream. And that's just what these figures are showing here. Um, other things that change the surface water hydrology is the very act of land clearing, right? You're changing the, the water system that was there um, in order to get to the bedrock beneath. So mining can alter the quality and velocity of flow um, by the discharge of stormwater, wastewater, by extracting or, uh, or dumping or depositing waste in stream channels and floodplains, um, by altering natural flow patterns, um, and by impounding water. And we see a couple examples here. They also, um, Tom talked about dewatering, and that can have an effect. This is largely based upon the permeability of the surface, surface geology, um, but you can see the kind of the natural base flow when a water table is elevated, and as that's drawn down in the local area, that can have an influence on stream dynamics based upon the role that groundwater plays in that system. I should note that from what we see about the abundance of wetlands, and cold water streams in the area, I don't know if I said this before, but we should think about the groundwater and surface water really as one continuous system, because they are very highly coupled in this area, um, just based on what we see on the, on the surface. So, this change in the physics of the hydrology can have implications on and off site depending on how the plan is implemented, um, what the changes are. But some examples, some very common, uh, kind of straightforward, obvious examples are the uh, placement of tailings, the uh, construction of the mine pit, and associated infrastructure. Physical changes to the landscape that can alter that hydrology and have effects uh, downstream potentially. Uh, and I mentioned groundwater. I won't go into that other than mention, um, we talked about dewatering, the potential for it to affect the surface system. Um, 
groundwater can also have an effect on the water quality if the quality of that groundwater is significantly different from the surface water. For instance, some, 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 uh, some aquifers are elevated in brines and can therefore, if discharged, um, have an impact on the surface water system. So then touching briefly on water quality considerations. Um, and this just shows a, a kind of a, some of the typical examples uh, how water and precipitation can move through a waste uh, system that depends a lot on how it's engineered and constructed. Um, so water and oxygen moving through, whether it be runoff, infiltration, um, down into the groundwater. Um, these are all possible. Again, I'm not speaking to the engineering controls that might be implemented. But when we look at iron ore projects, uh, metals, heavy metals and, and otherwise that tend to be associated with these types of projects are things like manganese, chromium, magnesium, cobalt, nickel. These are what we're talking about that have to meet the water quality standards. And they tend to be trace metals. So relatively small concentrations in the ore, but because we're talking about such, such large scale and intensive projects, uh, big things have small beginnings and it can become an issue. Water quality is, a, is really focused on for mine projects because um, once an issue is detected, particularly if it's associated with the waste, it's hard to, to address the issue after it's begun because you've got tons of rock uh, or material that that's coming from. So upfront good science is very important. Also just a note, this is just an example, it's not meant to relate to the specific site, but that toxins can have synergistic effects aside from any single metal. And so this is a case on one specific analyte where cadmium and copper had a, a, a multiplicative effect on the toxicity, um, which highlights the, really the complexity of uh, ecology and the effects on the environment uh, yeah. And then, of course, uh, selenium. In Michigan, selenium has been an issue. Um, I, I, you know, how that relates to the geology on the local area, uh, I'd have to uh, leave for Tom or others. But um, at higher levels, that can affect fish development. And of course, we're talking about a lot of very important fisheries resources, both on the site and downstream. So something to be aware of, something that needs to be considered in the development of any project and review. And then uh, last, uh, we talked about sulfate. Um, Sulfate can be generated from the liberation of high sulfur ores. Pyrite's a very common example that's cited. Elevated sulfate levels are fairly common in the Iron Range in Minnesota. And what seems to happen is it mobilizes downstream, deposits, deposits in the wetland environment, and then converts back to a sulfide that inhibits the root tissue and, and compromises the fitness overall of wild rice. So the concentrations that come out of that are very important and how they mo how, to what extent they mobilize and deposit downstream. And we're talking about on the scale of generations because that's really the interest of the tribal community is to maintain this uh, into perpetuity for their community just as the ancestors did. Um, and this elevated sulfate levels are not necessarily related with acid. Uh, I mean, the same chemical processes take place, but you can have elevated sulfate without having acid. And I think that's an important thing to remember because oftentimes we talk a lot about the potential for acid generation, which is a very meaningful thing to review um, when any time pyrite is known to be present. Um, but some of these effects, the leaching of metals under neutral conditions, elevated sulfate, can happen irrespective of generating acid. Um, and so this is an important part of the future review process and the science that I hope will go into it. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Craig Benson from UW-Madison who's going to talk to us about environmental mitigation of mining. Welcome, Craig. Thank you. It's good to be here. I've lived in Wisconsin 25 years now. and. Uh, what I see here tonight is one of the great things I think about our state, our commitment to the environment, our commitment to community, uh, and our commitment to doing things right. And uh, I came here, I grew up in eastern Pennsylvania, and we, um, we lived both in the Lehigh Valley, which is a very uh, industrial area, and we lived in the Pocono Mountains, and we used to go between those two. And I, I always had this opportunity to see these two very different worlds, a very industrial community, a kind of dirty community, in a very beautiful community in the uh, in the Pocono Mountains, and in fact, when I would we would go travel between those two, we would go past this New Jersey zinc smelter, 
where there was not a single living thing around it for, for a mile. It was just, it was, it was a different day. But it taught me something that we had an obligation both to have industry that uh, supported our economy and that we also had an obligation to protect our environment and that the, really the, the goal was the nexus of those two things, to, to support our economy and then to, to develop engineering and other, other control systems that allow us to protect the environment. And that's what really drove a lot of my career is to be at that interface and uh, I've been doing it at the university for uh, 25 years. and. Uh, and we depend on a lot of things in our, in our world. And I work, my work has largely been how we manage wastes from different types of industrial systems so that we can essentially have the industrial processes continue that support our good quality of life, but protect the environment at the, at the same time. And I think when we look at any particular industrial process, we need to look at ourselves. What do we, how do we rely on that? And then what is our stewardship responsibility? So for example, you look at, and all of us use mine products every day. I've got, does anybody have a smartphone in their pocket? Yeah, these smartphones, you know what, these are really neat. The glass, this is like magic glass. You touch it and it connects to the internet. That's because it's got an indium uh, coating on it. That glass is a special glass. It's got a mined element on the surface. So all of us who have smartphones enjoy this really wonderful aspect of of a special element that's on our, our product. So, so we use these materials and we have an obligation then to be able to uh, use them in a way that's environmentally uh, protective as well. We talk about mining, a couple of the really large impacts are associated with one that Cyrus talked a lot about, about water. There's a lot of water that gets moved in mining operations, some of it gets contaminated, it often gets moved in and out of watersheds, that's one of the major impacts. And another side of it is about the waste that we generate. Waste rock, heard a little bit about that from Steve, and we heard about that from Cyrus and some of the other speakers as well, and something else called tailings as well. These are essentially waste products of the process that are generated to give us the ore resources that we rely on for the things that bring us quality of life. And uh, waste rock uh, is, uh, is essentially that, that rock that we remove to get at the ore. We have to remove it to get at the material that we want to be able to extract the, the resource out of that ore that's important to us. For example, iron in these materials, or it could be copper, could be lead, it could be zinc, it could be phosphate. Um, the tailings are the other side of that. We take the rock, we bring it into a plant, we crush it, often crush it into a very fine particulate, and in, in many applications then we extract the, the metal from that particular particulate, and then we're left over with some leftover mineral matter, which we have to, to manage. And both, what's unique to both of those materials is that they, they, we brought them deep into the ground and we brought them up to the surface. So we brought them to the surface in a really unnatural environment. And they were, they've been deep down on the ground for a million years. And all of a sudden we bring them up to the a surface, very different condition. It's a condition which is rich in oxygen, rich in water. It's a very different type of environment. So we've, we've taken something and really changed its environment that it's in. And, and therefore it behaves differently. And that's the big challenge that we deal with is how to manage these materials in an environment in which they haven't been in in millions of years. Uh, and some materials, when we bring them to the surface, are relatively inert uh, at the Earth's surface. They essentially put them on the Earth's surface and they have no impact. Others are very reactive and they can create some environmental damage that we need to be cognizant of. So we think about it, you know, they're just rocks, right? We just bring them up to the surface. Well, a lot of these rocks, as I indicated, they've been way down below the earth. Some of them, maybe only 100 feet, but maybe men, uh, some are, are a mile or more. And where oxygen concentrations are low and water is less frequent, and we bring them up, they can contact with oxygen. And that ox creates oxidation of minerals, and that tends to liberate minerals and create other types of reactions that occur. And that can liberate other kinds of metals uh, other types of contaminants that can affect groundwater and can affect surface water as well. Just an example, this is this, I, I gotta have a little chemistry in here. I'm an academic, uh, I'm an engineering professor, I gotta put a little bit of math and chemistry in this. But that's a simple thing that happens. This is a, that's a picture of pyrite on the right, and this is a, a chemical reaction, it's real simple. We take pyrite, we mix it with oxygen, which it hasn't been in contact with, water, and it reacts, and we create sulfate, that's a sulfur compound. Iron gets dissolved in the water and hydrogen or, or protons create acid. And of course acid, we know, dissolves things, right? And it dissolves things and liberates other metals uh, into the environment. 
And so that's just one example of something that can occur in mining. That's that's a that's a, a acid mine drainage phenomena that liberates metals, and then those metals, which have long been stored in the rock for millions of years, all of a sudden are mobile in the environment and can escape. Another one that, that Cyrus mentioned, one I work with a lot these days, is managing selenium. Selenium is another element uh, that's in rock, uh, and rocks that are deep below the earth, uh, we bring them up to the surface and on their, in contact with oxygen, and that selenium, which has been bound very carefully in the rock, all of a sudden is very mobile. And selenium forms something called an oxyanion, and that oxyanion is something, when it gets in water, it moves very quickly and very uh, uh, rapidly without any... Uh, 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 abatement. Uh, and so we have to deal with these, these issues, um, and, and this happens regardless of where we bring the rocks from. In fact, you've probably seen county roads or highways built by your house. We use limestone granite for building those roads. You know that metals leach out of that, that gravel that you put underneath the, the concrete or the asphalt. We've measured that. Sites down in southern Wisconsin, we've measured cadmium and chromium leaching out of the, the, the uh, dolomite and limestone that we use for base course and roadways. It's not uncommon. And so it's really about, we realize this happens in all rocks that we bring to the surface it, because we put them in an unnatural environment. It's just about controlling it. It's really about controlling how much can get into the environment. And that's really what our, my business has all been about. It's about how do we control the waste in our environment and keep them separated from, um, from the water and the air that we rely on. And one of the things we need to keep in context when we talk about how much you know, they're escaping the environment and how much can, uh, can we allow, is that you know, all these elements that release aren't so bad for you. I was dealing with an interesting project with uh, both selenium and zinc, and uh, there was a big uproar about release of this env environment, and this newspaper article came out on the same day about flu fighters and how we had to be eating these, these elements at the same time. So it's about balance. Some of these things we need in our diet, they're healthy for us, too much, and it's a problem. And so it's about balance and how much we can allow into the environment. That's really what about mine waste containment is. We have a waste within uh, a waste material here. Maybe it's waste rock. Maybe it's tailings. And what we've done over over the last couple of decades is figure out how to engineer systems to contain and isolate these materials essentially in perpetuity. We develop very sophisticated lining systems, cover systems collection systems that go in the base. Actually, a lot of this technology being developed right here in Wisconsin uh, that has been proven to be very effective uh, worldwide. We use materials like this. This is a lining system. We call this a composite liner. It has a clay liner and a, and a geomembrane. It's a heavy-duty plastic sheet that goes on top of it. We call this a composite barrier system that clay and plastic work together to create an extremely effective barrier system. And we've demonstrated the effectiveness of these barrier systems around the world. Uh, sometimes we build them out of synthetic clays or just synthetic clay liners, and I brought some of these materials if anybody's interested in afterwards to take a look at. And then we have collection systems to collect that, that contaminated water that collects, that's associated with, with the waste rock or the tailing so we can take it to a treatment plant and manage it. Sometimes we use multiple layer systems as well. If we're really concerned about the contaminants, we can use multiple layer systems. These, these have been found to be so effective that essentially nothing escapes from them. And their lifetimes, we've demonstrated that their lifetime can be on the order of a thousand years or more. So we can really create very effective uh, systems. Cover systems are the same. So I talked a lot about things in the bottom. We talk about how we can control things on the top. We use similar type of materials or we use natural systems. But we design very effective systems to limit the ingress of water and the ingress of oxygen. The two things that are in that equation I showed earlier that generate the reactions. If we control the water and the oxygen, we can control how much uh, reaction occurs. So what do we know? Uh, we, well, first of all, a lot of this, uh, the, we really know how to contain these type of waste very effectively. Uh, we've got really rigorous um, regulations in our state. And as I look at kind of the, the, the nexus of things that's important, we need to have strong regulations. We need to have communities that demand responsibility from regulatory authorities and from companies. Uh, we need to have um, companies that are good stewards of our environment. We need to have that triad of things to be effective. And of course, we need the technology to be able to implement those regulations effectively. And we have that here. We developed that a lot in Wisconsin. We know it works. Uh, and uh, we've got lots of information developed worldwide to illustrate that it works very effectively. 
I do think we can contain mine waste safely for very long periods of time. We've tested this around the world. It's really a matter of people like the regulatory agencies to make sure that we implement our technologies properly and the engineers and scientists to make sure that it's designed and, and um, executed properly. And with thoughtful engagement, as I indicated, the mining industry, a public regulatory agency, we can be successful and we can protect the environment. So I'll leave it at that. Our last speaker tonight before the break is Ann Coakley from the DNR, and she'll be speaking about regulating metallic mining in Wisconsin. Welcome, Ann. Thank you, and speaking of that regulator, I guess that's me and why they had me go last. Um, I really feel very blessed to be with this distinguished group of gentlemen tonight, and hardly worthy, but it's my pleasure to be here. So I'm going to cover three topics tonight, all very briefly, because we all feel like we would like to have time for all of you to ask the questions that you'd like to ask. I'm going to cover the mining program and where it's set up in the Department of Natural Resources, talk very briefly about exploration and bulk sampling and how they're regulated, and then cover the mine permitting process. So first of all, about our mining program. As some of you know, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources is broken into six different divisions. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to concentrate on the division that my program is located in, and that's the Air Waste Remediation and Redevelopment Division. And within that division, there are three programs, Air Management, Remediation and Redevelopment, and then the program that I'm lucky to be the director of, that's the Waste and Materials Management Program. And then further within my program, we have a very diverse program. Um, you know, they lumped a lot of different things together, and it's a pretty small bureau. There are only 70 of us. We cover the recycling program for the state of Wisconsin, uh, the landfill and solid waste program, all of the regulation for hazardous waste generators, the beneficial use of industrial byproducts, and lastly, mining. And I often get asked, why, why is mining in the Waste Bureau? And our, our name is really Waste and Materials Management, and obviously mines produce materials, and what is left behind after mining has ceased is a waste disposal facility, and so that's why um, mining is in my bureau. Um, just to talk a little bit about the structure of the Ferris Mining Law, and again, I am covering only the Ferris Mining Law tonight, not the non-Ferris Mining Law, because we're talking about mining in the Potomki Range, which is almost surely to be ferrous mining. It became, uh, the new law became effective in March of last year, and it just uh, established a regulatory framework for ferrous mining. Separate from non-ferrous mining, it's located in Chapter 295 of our state statutes, whereas non-ferrous mining regulations are in Chapter 293. And it really regulates anything to do with iron mining, whether it be um, exploration, bulk sampling, or mining. So briefly, um, exploration is, uh, ferrous exploration is regulated very similarly to non-ferrous exploration. It's um, just defined as drilling and looking at an ore body to determine if it's an ore body that a company would want to mine and to also make some geological or mineral, mineralogical assessments about um, the applicant applies for a license. The department has 14 days to review the application. We do require bonding for exploration work that we issue a license for so that we could reclaim the sites if we needed to. For bulk sampling, it's the removal of uh, some amount of rock not to exceed 10,000 tons from a potential mining site. And it's uh, a mining company would be interested in removing a, a larger volume of rock to do some additional assessments on them, sometimes physical, sometimes mineralogical, and it's just to further their knowledge and information about a deposit to determine whether they're going to proceed with a mining application or a mine. When it comes to the department, this is a new provision in the ferrous mining law that is not in the non-ferrous mining law. Um, when a plan comes to the department with a $100,000 review fee, 
and um, within 14 days of receiving it, we have to let the company know what approvals they may need that are associated with bulk sampling because there's no bulk sampling approval. It's just if, they're, if an applicant happens to need another approval, like a stormwater permit. Um, the next stage, and, and not all companies would do bulk sampling in the non ferrous law, it's called prospecting. It's very similar where a company is looking to take um, a closer look at more materials. Um, not all companies go through that stage. Sometimes they do the exploration and they know for sure that they want to proceed with a mining plan. And in the Ferris Mining Law, the next step is a pre-application notice. And that's a uh, mining applicant must notify the Department of Natural Resources at least a year in advance of submitting a permit application um, before they actually submit the permit application. And once uh, they make that pre-application notification, we have pre-application meetings with the company to discuss all of the regulatory requirements that would be pertinent to the mining site. And then within 60 days of those meetings, we produce a letter describing the kind of information that we'll need to eventually process a mining permit application. Things like any of the approvals or permits that would be required and any of the filing requirements associated with them you know, most mining applications also include other permit applications such as a wastewater discharge permit, a stormwater permit, an air, man, um, an air quality permit. Um, so we detail those out from their conceptual mining plan, what we think they might need for permits. We also let them know what we'll require in their environmental impact report, what we'll require them to submit so that we can write our environmental impact statement, which I'll discuss in a further slides and um, any other information we think that we'll need to do a timely review of their project. So to jump right into the iron mining permitting process. This is just a graphic that shows how um, a company first does some preliminary studies, gathers all of the baseline data that they need to support their permit applications and environmental impact report. Then they put those together while they're doing their environmental studies, submit them to the Department of Natural Resources, and then we have 420 days to um, write our draft environmental impact statement, hold a public hearing on it, respond to comments, um, and then ultimately issue our decisions on the permits, you know, either approval or, den or denial. Um, the first, after our companies feels like they think they're going to apply for a mining permit. They do extensive environmental studies, baseline data collection on surface water, groundwater, air quality species, whether they be plant species, animal species. They do cultural and socioeconomic studies and all of their waste characterization work. And they gather this information to help them design their mine, um, to help them to avoid and minimize environmental impacts and record that information in their environmental impact report and permit apps. They also do um, a lot of environmental modeling to predict how surface water and groundwater will respond to mining activities in the future to ensure that the surface water and groundwater does not become contaminated by the mining operation. A, a, lot, of, a lot of baseline studies are needed f to develop a mine. So when, when the company has collected sufficient data to be able to produce an environmental impact report and apply for their permits, they send those to the department in a complete application. And in that application is a mining plan, a reclamation plan for how they plan to eventually reclaim the site and what the site will be after mining has ceased, and then the waste feasibility study report detailing what their waste facility will look like and how it will be monitored in the future. Then they also have to give us proof that they have all of the local approvals that they need and other statewide approvals. And then of course, the federal government also has um, approval authority over mining, whether it be the Environmental Protection AG, the Agency, the US Army Corps of Engineers, possibly the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Usually one of the agencies will take the lead for all of the federal agencies, and those permits are um, obtained by the mining company outside of our process. So 
what is the environmental impact report? This is a report that the mining applicant prepares on their own, and they, they have to present an analysis of what the environmental and socioeconomic conditions of, are in the project area at the time that they're applying for the permit. They have to have a complete project description, and then the projected impact of the mining project on the conditions both locally and regionally. And then they include an alternatives analysis that, described, that describes how they will avoid and minimize environmental impacts and how if they have environmental impacts, they might be mitigated. So the company gives us their base, they collect their baseline environmental data and um, submit that to us with permanent applications and their EIR, and that's when we draft our environmental impact statement and have a public hearing and eventually write a final environmental impact statement. Our environmental impact statement, there seems to be a lot of confusion regarding what is an EIR versus an EIS. So again, the EIR is submitted by the applicant and it uh, talks about the potential environmental impacts and how they um, will be avoided, minimized, and mitigated. And then we write an environmental impact statement and that's our agency view on the project and it's a disclosure document to disclose those effects and how they're going to be avoided, minimized, and mitigated. It's not uh, a report that makes the permit decisions. Those are made on individual permits that are submitted to us. And it's uh, prepared by the decision maker, which in, in the case in Wisconsin, that is the Department of Natural Resources. The ultimate decision is made by the head of our agency and we disclose the potential effects, whether it be an environmental effect on surface water, groundwater, wetlands, or if it's on tourism, employment, schools, and the like. Once we receive the information, we have some time to determine if it's complete or not. And once we do, we have 420 days to make all of the permit decisions and to write the EIS, including having the public hearing and responding to comments. We do the completeness check, we have 30 days to do that, and then we do an EIS scoping process. Um, we let the applicant know if there's any additional approvals that are gonna be required, and we draft the EIS. We have a public notice of availability and informational hearing, and we have to have that within 60 days. And then there's an official 45-day comment period, and we issue a written summary of the responses that we receive from the public comment on at either through from the hearing or in writing. And then we have to complete our um, final action to approve or deny um, in a written decision of all of the permit applications we receive, and this is all within the 420 days. And um, this is just straight from our statute. The DNR will approve our, or deny an application for a mining permit in writing and shall include a list of reasons for its decision with clarity and in detail. Um, lastly, I think this is my last slide. Along with the permit applications and environmental impact report, uh, mining companies under both the Ferris and non-Ferris law um, before beginning any mining activities, if they do have all of their permits approved, the operator has to demonstrate that they're financially stable and that there's money set aside to assure that reclamation can happen at any point during the project and that long-term monitoring and care of the facility is covered. So money is set aside so that, you know, if someday the mine had to close down or when it just naturally, you know, they're out of um, economic iron ore, that money is set aside that if the state had to step in, we could and we would have the money to properly reclaim the site and conduct the long-term care and monitoring. And then the long-term monitoring has to be done for a minimum of 20 years and it can be extended to 40 years. And that's, this is very similar to our landfill law. The same requirements are on solid waste disposal facilities. That's what I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our first question is a three-part question, and I'm going to assign it to three of our speakers to start. We hear conflicting reports about the presence of sulfides and asbestiform minerals in the overburden. 
What is the state of knowledge about the presence of contaminants? And I'd ask Professor, Professor Fitz to resummarize what he had talked about. Um, second part is what further studies or investigations are planned? I would, I would hand that off to Steve or Ann or anyone else who has knowledge of, of the plans for the site. And then lastly, how would the presence of contaminants impact the regulatory process? And I'd ask Ann to address that. So let's start with the state of the knowledge with Professor Fitz, please. Okay. Is this on? Can you hear me? Is that on? Okay. Um, let's see. The question's about pyrite and um, asbestiform minerals in the overburden. Okay. Um, the overburden, some of the, some of the rock that would come out to give access to the iron formation is in the Tyler formation. And the lower part of the Tyler formation does contain pyrite. Okay. And then... Um, in the other question is about the asbestiform uh, minerals in there, the amphibole minerals, and um, there probably is not any in the Tyler Formation because the geology and composition is not correct there. The uh, grunerite and other amphibole minerals are just within the iron formation, and um, because that's where the geology is correct, the amphiboles are iron-rich amphiboles, so they would occur uh, just within the iron formation. Thank you. And we do, we're at a slight disadvantage tonight in that we don't have anyone who actually speaks for the company uh, answering questions tonight. So some of these questions we're going to answer more in the abstract for this type of a project. And I'd ask Steve uh, to talk about what further studies would be typical at this stage in a process uh, to determine what kind of uh, um, potential uh, presence of these types of substances would be found. Sure. A, uh, an important part of the, uh, uh, we heard the description of baseline studies that are going to be conducted for the project. Uh, an important part of the baseline studies is going to be the geochemical, what, what you'd call the geochemical characterization of the rock and the ore and the tailings. Uh, there's a whole battery of testing that will be conducted by the mining company this is required under the statute, uh, so the bill that was passed uh, a little over a year ago requires this type of testing to look at what the mineralogy of the materials is. Uh, so are these types of uh, mineral assemblages uh, uh, present in the, uh, in, in the rock and in the tailings, in the ore, and what's their abundance? Uh, information that's used then to design the project, design the waste containment facilities, et cetera, that are going to be uh, uh, engineered for the facility. And then also to test how they're going to behave in the environment. So there's a whole series of standardized tests that have been developed to look at uh, things related to sulfide and how that's, uh, what's the abundance of that? Is it there? How abundant is it? Uh, uh, what's the potential for it to react? What kinds of constituents might uh, percolate from the rock and the tailings, et cetera. Uh, very extensive testing program that uh, is required under the statute as part of the baseline studies uh, that have to be documented and provided to the uh, regulatory agencies and then factored into the engineering of the project. And, and then, Ann, you had talked about this to some degree in your, uh, in your presentation. Could you summarize for us how, I'll rephrase the question a little, how the, the, the potential varying, varying degrees of potential um, presence of these types of substances could impact how the regulatory process would proceed. Sure, and I'll, I'll add to what Steve just said in that when the company is doing their waste rock characterization and ore body characterization, all of their geochemical work, the Department of Natural Resources would also do verification samples where we would split samples of the rock, split water samples, uh, groundwater samples, and by split, I mean we would collect our own samples while the company's collecting their own, and we would use the state lab of, lab of hygiene just to do ver verification sampling, and we did that with the um, Crandon project and the Flambeau project, and we continue to do that today with the long-term monitoring of the Flambeau project. And then to get to, to the question about what will these, what could things mean to a mining project? So what we know right now is that both uh, sulfides and amphiboles have been noted in the Pinocchi range, and that dates back to well over a century ago and has been confirmed many times since then. What we don't have is a lot of um, data on it, a lot of laboratory data at all. We don't have much at all. 
And so we can't make a conclusion about the concentration or the distribution of these materials at this time, but it will be the most important part of this project to do the geochemical characterization. And then what it means for the project, it's hard to say right now because we've had iron mines that have had sulfides in them, like the Jackson County Iron Mine, which does have some pyrite, where that wasn't a problem with the Jackson County Iron Mine. However, there have been other mines where sulfides, iron mines where sulfides have been a really big problem. And if there's a large concentration of sulfides, it could mean a lot of different things. It could mean the company would have to alter the way that they operate the mine. It would have significant impacts on what type of waste facility they would design, whether it would need a liner and a cap. and leachate collection and treatment and just how that ultimate waste disposal facility would be designed and um, operated and then eventually closed and monitored. And it's really just too hard to say right now with what little information we have. And while you have the mic in your hand, Ann, could you uh, explain to everyone precisely what step in the regulatory process the current proposal is in for the Pinocchi um, project? Sure. The company, Gogebic Taconite, is in the baseline environmental data collection stage, and I believe they're also working on their mining design. Thank you. The next question is Professor, for Professor Parker, um, and it relates to the economic impacts on communities that range farther beyond what we saw on the maps today, maybe outside of the of the Bad River watershed and outside of the area of the deposit. Um, what kind of an ec economic impact can we see as we move farther and further away from, these, from the mining site in areas such as Minocqua, Eagle River, Rhinelander, and up into the northwest part of the state? Thank you. So, uh, yeah, that's a, a great question. The estimates of multipliers that I talked about are of course pretty sensitive to the spatial scale of the effects and of the estimates. So in some cases, if the mining area is very rural, you can have small multiplier effects because there isn't a lot of housing infrastructure in the area. And so the actual economic activity that's generated can be outside of the area of where the mine is actually located. This is certainly true in rural areas um, uh, in the west, in Alaska, very rural areas. Um, the, 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 other, the other element of the question is about spillover spatially into broader geographic regions. It, the, the, there can be spillovers, especially in a case like this where supplies might come from two or three counties away, and so the economic effects can spill over to those areas where there's an increased demand, uh, increased demand for the supplies that will go into the capital investments that the mine might make. It's also true of transportation. There can be benefits, certainly through this region and, and, and down to Milwaukee. They're harder to d detect empirically because you know, the ripple gets smaller as you move spatially, like an earthquake, and so it's hard to comment precisely on what those would be, but they're there. The final, I guess, response to this is, you know, if you take it to the limit, though, and you think about, you know, what's the economic impacts at too broad of a region, then you're just ta talking about mainly transferring jobs around, and, and the impacts actually get smaller if you think of too broad of a scale, so. I hope that gets up the question. Very much so. Thank you. The next question is for Cyrus Hester. What roles do the federal government and the tribes have in regulating the mine? How do these groups interact with the state regulatory process? Do I have the rest of the night? <laughs> so um, well, speaking very briefly to the federal process, um, it would be anticipated that the Army Corps of Engineers would be involved under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act for the filling of wetlands. That would trigger the standard federal process for a major project, including an environmental impact statement that um, may or may not be aligned with the state process. Currently, it seems less likely. Um, during any of those, uh, any of that process, um, 
tribes or other agencies may participate as cooperating agencies to inform the development of that EIS, um, but the permit would really be focused on that, the filling of, of wetlands uh, or any effects to waters of the United States. The tribes uh, have a number of ways to interact. One is as, as a cooperating agency uh, and any type of review process like that, um, and that could be Bad River, that could be any tribe um, in the area, and re just a reminder that this is happening in uh, on lands that were ceded um, under treaties in the 19th century, but where a number of tribes, signatory tribes, retain rights, sovereign rights, um, to uh, hunt, fish, and gather uh, on those lands. Um, but the more, the, or the other way that tribes engage, or could engage, or Bad River in particular, is through delegated authorities under federal law. So tribes as sovereign nations, just as states, can um, implement the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act. Uh, Bad River has authority under both of those laws, for sections of under both of those laws. And I think the most relevant to a project such as the one in, in uh, question are the, is under the Clean Water Act and the tribe's water quality standards, which were federally approved in 2011 and have a number of designated uses and criteria which have to be met at the reservation boundary. Um, and we would work with both the state and the federal agencies, I, I hope, to ensure that that was, uh, was done. Thank you. The next one is for, I'm going to throw it at three of you, but I'm going to ask Professor Benson to start since he hasn't gotten a chance yet. But uh, Professor Benson, Cyrus, Hester, maybe Professor Fitz, Brownstone Falls is the tallest and most spectacular waterfall in Copper Falls State Park, a beautiful natural area and an important tourist attraction. What will happen to Brownstone Falls if the proposed mine goes in? given that the falls is fed by the Tyler Forks and its headwaters. He gave me a hard one. <laughs> I don't know enough about that falls to really give you a, a responsible answer, but if you affect the hydrology of an area, you affect the, the water resources and the, you will affect the flows and that can affect the quality of the falls and, and, and that's something that would be part of the process of evaluating the impacts on the hydrologic system. I don't know enough about that specific hydrologic system to really give an informed answer, and perhaps one of the other speakers does. Pass the buck. How do you like that? <laughs> Tom? <laughs> no. Um, well, so, I mean, yeah, we're talking about, I think what the question is getting at is kind of the water budget of the system. And that information um, I don't think has been collected or analyzed to the extent that is really needed to determine the probability of a of a significant effect on, on that feature. But certainly Brownstone Falls is talking about the connection of the Tyler Forks subwatershed um, and the, the Upper Bad. And both of those, um, those are the, the subwatersheds where the phase one of the project is proposed. Um, and the, the key question is then, what is the process? How is the water used? How is the water managed on the site? And then the overall water budget of those systems, both in the groundwater and surface water sense. Um, and I would state that it's, it's too early to even understand what's being proposed to know if there'd be a specific effect. Um, but to interpret the question more broadly, then could get at aesthetics, which might be considered under environmental impact statement, and then potential visible effects to a recreational area or other uh, noise and things like that um, should also be considered. And I'm going to cop out of knowing the answer to that too, but just recognizing that it's, it could be beyond just the quantity of water um, that the question gets to. Anybody have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah. Steve? <clears throat> Again, uh, uh, you know, the, the projects in, uh, in the early stages of doing their baseline studies and another component of the baseline studies is to look at the uh, regional hydrology and hydrogeology. So that's going to involve installation of wells to look at how groundwater is flowing, interacting with wetlands, interacting with streams. And all of that data is documented in the baseline reports and will be evaluated. Uh, ostensibly in the uh, environmental impact report that's provided to the state to look at uh, not only water quality and potential water quality impacts but also those water quantity impacts so uh, theoretically if uh, mine dewatering how is that potentially going to affect flows and streams etc 
and certainly in past projects in the state, and I certainly think the DNR will be looking at this again, if those uh, uh, dewatering effects, uh, things of that nature would have uh, any kind of a negative effect on the flow in the streams that could affect, affect uh, habitat and things like that. Uh, that's part of the <clears throat> mitigation that has to be examined as part of both the state and also the federal EIS process. So that'll be an issue that is uh, uh, evaluated quite thoroughly as part at both the state and the uh, federal level. Thank you. Next question I'll pitch to anybody who would like to weigh in on it, and that is, how many core drillings are necessary to determine the presence of, well, to determine the, the makeup of both the, uh, the, the ore body and the overburden such that you would have the information necessary to plan your mine and to regulate the mine? <laughs> okay, I'll try that one first. Um, it's, uh, sitting here today, we don't know that. Um, what a company usually does is they start out with a few and then they add to it based on what they found in their first, say, five to ten borings, and then they'll do five to ten more, and, you know, maybe they'll ultimately do a hundred borings. It's, it's hard to say, but they, they characterize the ore body and the waste rock and get enough information that they can design a mine and write their environmental impact report and apply for the permits. And while they're doing that, they consult with the Department of Natural Resources, and we look at the core with them, and we decide if we think that there's enough information there, too. So it's a process that's done jointly, and that process has not begun yet for this project. So sitting here today, I can't say how many it will be, um, but it's, it's enough to satisfy us that we know the ore body well and that we know the waste rock very well, because, again, it's the most important part of the project. Anybody want to add anything to that perfect answer? <laughs> okay. I'm jumping around on you here, and I apologize for that, but we're trying to get to the questions raised in the, in the, um, by the audience. What is the reclamation process for the pit, for the, for the mine, excavation site? Um, anyone who wants to go after that, please feel free. I'm going to have to get the pointer out and start. I, I think it's, uh, uh, they're still in the evaluation stage of looking at how they're going to develop the open pit and how they're going to reclaim the site. So uh, again, we're the, the, it's early days in the project and I don't think enough, I certainly don't know what the reclamation plan is for, for the project at this stage to comment on that. In your experience, Steve, what are the, some of the types of strategies that people use in, in reclamation? Well, there, they, I'm sure there's a, a number of strategies that could be looked at ranging from reclaiming it as an open pit lake to reclaiming it uh, with backfill, taking some of the waste rock and potential tailings, and it's all going to depend on what the geochemistry of those materials are, and using that to backfill the mine. I certainly think that's something that's being looked at. Uh, but uh, no formal mine plan has been developed at this stage, but I'm sure all that stuff is going to be examined, and it's been used elsewhere in the state. Um, the Flambeau mine uh, was certainly backfilled quite successfully. <clears throat> Thank you. I am going to pitch this to anyone who would like to take it also, because I really don't know who to, who to ask it of. Who owns the land where the mine is being proposed? Who owns the mineral rights on that land, and how do the land ownership and mineral ownership interact. I hazard to say I may know the most about that of anyone up here. However, I'm not exactly sure because I'm not exactly sure what the entire mine site will be. Um, it looks like a lot of it is owned by a company called RGGS Minerals. I know that there are other owners. Um, I, I don't know all of them, and I think it's possible that some of the waste disposal facility might be on Iron County land. Um, and beyond that, I, I don't think we know yet because the project is in the conceptual design stages. And what we do know is out on our website, Go Gibbic Tech, and I provided a land ownership map. So, you know, if you really want to know, you could go out to our website and look at that. 
Um, but for sure, I know one is RGGS Minerals and that there's a high potential for Iron County forest land being used. Thank you. And if any of you notice what sounds somewhat like your question being asked, but it's not exactly it, I've noticed a trend here and we're going to try to stick with the, the generalities about this type of mining to the extent it's within the expertise of the speakers. And in that vein, can one of you talk to the audience about the volumes of water that are needed for taconite processing and mining um, in a general sense? <laughs> Nobody said they were going to make it easy on you guys. A lot. A real lot. <laughs> Another perfect answer. <laughs> and this question is for you. What is the, you, you talked a lot in your, in your presentation about the limitations on uh, the time that, are, that is available for you to, to uh, issue a permitting decision should this company decide to present the department with a proposal with a, with a permit application. Realistically then, at the stage we're in in the process, can you, and if you can't that's fine, but it, can you give the audience a general idea of when it's, a range of when it's possible that there could be a mine operating in northern Wisconsin? No, I don't think it's possible for me to do that because the onus on this is exclusively on the applicant. So the applicant could apply for a permit whenever they would like to after June 17th of this year because that's when the 12 months are up on the pre-application notification. I don't think they will this summer because I don't think they have the data they need. However, they will decide when they apply for their permits and they completely control the quality of their application also. That's something that's out of everybody else's control. So when we get a permit application is up to them, the quality of it is up to them. In order to be able to review it in the 420 days, which I'm guessing you all think is not a long period of time, but in, if, we're, if we're gonna do it in 420 days, it's going to be, have to be a very, very high quality applications and environmental impact report, and I know that the applicant knows that. So, um, you know, my guess is we won't get um, in an, uh, an application this year. However, I don't know that for sure, but once we get it, um, it has to be very, very good if we're going to be able to meet that timeline. Thank you. It's very helpful. Uh, Mr. Hester, the next question, if you would. What do the data that have been gathered to date show to be uh, the current water quality of the water resources in the project area and and is there a potential for damage as far downstream as Lake Superior? The first part is easier. Um, some data has been collected in the in the headwaters area in the vicinity of the project area by a number of organizations, um, nonprofits, the state, uh, the tribe and others. And uh, by and far, those, those headwater streams are of excellent quality. Uh, some of the best evidence is the macroinvertebrate community. So those basis of the food chain um, tend to score very high in the, in the indices of biological integrity. Um, and of course, the fact that they host cold water uh, fisheries is also indicative of a, uh, I don't want to use the word pristine, but um, highly functioning system that includes consistent groundwater, wetland, and forest uh, functions, the shading, all the things I talked about, um, that all has to be intact for those types of species to persist in that area. When we talk about effects all the way downstream to Lake Superior, the question then is, what is the impact we're talking about? Um, I mentioned that some of the physical changes um, in the headwaters could have effects. Um, one of the questions, the big questions, is effects on the thermal regime. I can't state the area of effect uh, that that would, would or would not have. Um, it would, of course, almost all of these questions are going to depend upon what processes and activities are actually proposed by the applicant and what the area of effect that results from that is. Um, but generally, as, as I mentioned, the watersheds um, are viewed as highly connected systems and they depend upon the role of headwaters. Um, headwaters play a disproportionate role in the overall functioning of those systems. 
So um, I hope I answered that uh, well enough. Thank you. I have, we have a, a wealth of geology knowledge at this table, so I'll again leave this to anyone who wants to answer it. Are there other iron mines that have been operated successfully without releasing contamination to off-site locations and that have been adequately reclaimed once the mining operation has ceased? That can compare to the, well, again, we don't know what this proposal is going to exactly be, but just in a general sense. Well, in the state of Wisconsin, we have the Jackson County Iron Mine that was operated and has been successfully reclaimed. There was groundwater and surface water monitoring during the operation of that mine and afterward, and um, there was no significant contamination associated with it. Um, you know, we don't know a lot about the historic iron mines in that region, the hematite mines, and like the last mine that closed, the Cary mine, because environmental monitoring wasn't required during the operation of that mine, nor was it required afterward. That said, we don't, we also don't know of any notable, notable long-term effects of that, those mines, but you know, we really don't know. So that's what I can speak to in Wisconsin. Um, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the specifics of the mines in um, Michigan, and there's, you know, certainly, uh, without a doubt, has been contamination noted with the um, iron mining, open pit mining in Minnesota. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't say I don't know anything about Michigan because there was the one mine, the Dober mine, that had significant sulfide problems added. Um, but I don't know. I don't know that I can say there has been a successful mine operated and reclaimed in either Michigan or Minnesota. But I also don't know that there is not. Just a very brief follow up. Um, one big difference in Wisconsin is, of course, the scale of historic mining, Jackson or County or otherwise, to what would be proposed probably even in Phase One. Um, again, it's still very early, but just the scale is going to be very different. Um, and then just a comment that, in general, um, so when we, th I think the question is getting at something of a legal uh, nuance, that is whether or not they complied with all applicable laws. And I know that's been contentious, at least in Minnesota, regarding whether or not the state has always implemented all of the regulations, such as whether or not uh, discharge permits were kept up to date or expired or whether or not the sulfate criteria which was in the state's water quality standards was implemented. And in both cases it, it was not, but the, the companies then were not necessarily at fault, nor did they commit uh, a violation, but rather it was, they weren't expected to in that, con in that, in that case. And let me add that, um, and I think you all know this, but the historic iron mining that occurred in Minnesota and Michigan was also done pre-regulation, just like our historic hematite mines in Wisconsin. So, you know, it's hard to cast a lot of blame on companies who were just doing what companies did. You know, now that we have modern day regulations, we wouldn't permit a mine that we thought would have any potential for contaminating the environment. and. The Jackson County Iron Mine mainly operated pre-law. It just really fell under the law for the last little bit of its operation, and then um, it fell under their reclamation law, and they did properly reclaim that site and received a certificate of completion. But again, the mines with the um, notable problems in our sister states were definitely started pre-environmental regulation. Thank you. The next question is for Professor Parker. Based on the current world price of iron ore and the, and the addition of additional iron ore facilities, mining facilities um, in other parts of the world, as an economist, what future do you see for the, a, a, a mining project in Wisconsin? Well, the answer is gonna be entirely speculative. But being an economist, I have no problem with that. We, <laughs> we, 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 do, we speculate for a living. Uh, I, I mean, one thing about world prices, and certainly of, of, of minerals, including oil and gas, is that when prices spike, the market reaction is typically to try to find and explore and locate more of the minerals. And, 
you know, geophysicists help in that process. Um, the, the experts find more minerals, they find more oil, and that has this effect of pushing down the prices. So anytime you see high prices, um, at least historically, they're unlikely to sustain for a long period of time just because of that market reaction. So, um, so that, that's, that's one comment. The other is that you know, there's, there's some complications that I was talking with Tom about earlier about you know, how responsive the local mining industry is to the world price of iron ore given that uh, a lot of taconite is used internally within the country rather than shipped overseas and there isn't much importing of the taconite as well. So I did look at some prices. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a subscriber to metalprices.com, and uh, my subscription's about to run out, so I need to renew. But it's, it's a great resource. And um, I was looking at the prices that dealers were paying in Chicago and Pittsburgh and other local areas. And they correlate really well with the world prices. So the world prices are, are a driver of um, at least they're a, a constraint on um, the prices uh, that, that the local markets are responding to. So I speculated and dodged at the same time, both, both skills of economists. If you wouldn't have said it, nobody would have noticed. <laughs> the next question is prof for Professor Fitz and Professor Benson. And I'm going to generalize because we got a lot of questions actually from people in the audience who were interested in learning more about what, if any, concerns there are associated with a mine in an area with the geology that we see in the Pinocchies with respect to mercury. And uh, if there is a concern either in mercury contamination, water, or airborne, you know, what kinds of uh, solutions would we expect to see? Uh, I understand that the mercury from the taconite industry uh, mostly comes from the creation of the pellets during the making of the pellets and that it is uh, largely airborne and that the input from um, basically coal fires from around the world is greater than that from the taconite industry, but taconite is second. That's what I know. Yeah, and the, the nice thing about airborne mercury, we know how to manage that really well. I mean, we've done a lot of work, actually, that came out of the coal-fired electric utility about how to ca capture mercury and off-gases from systems like that with carbon capture and the like. So that's a really well-developed technology. And there's also uh, uh, some really um, well-developed technologies for um, mercury capture and, uh, and sequestration in, in waste rock and tailings as well. So essentially geochemical strategies that have been developed for other industries that apply to this industry just as well. Thank you. We, we just touched there on the next question, and that is, what if any site-specific or, or northern Wisconsin-specific air quality uh, concerns might there be moving forward with a project like this in this, in this area? Um, in broad strokes, uh, mercury, of course, uh, comes out and the, the control, there are some control options for that. Um, interesting, I, mean, I know that there's been some delay in implementing control technologies up on the iron range and it'd be interesting to see w whether that's an economic barrier or, or something else. Um, but uh, mercury, taconite being, uh, taconite production being the number one source of mercury emissions in the Lake Superior Basin, which was just a, a different scale of perception. Um, the, depending on how the tailings uh, and waste are managed, um, depending on whether it's some type of dust control, if it is a dry stack or a, a basin, um, of course, windblown dust, metals and metalloids that might be transported with that, that has to do with potential sources. But then again, it has to do, the question is what intervention uh, is implemented and, uh, and how, of course, is the site engineered? Is it going to, in fact, be a dry stack or, or will they go with a more conventional basin? Um, those stand out, and then of course, this is an energy intensive process, right? Um, so whether it's from the site or off, uh, off site, um, things like greenhouse gases should be considered in the modern context, um, just as an overall footprint of, the, of such a project. Anybody have anything they want to add to that? I, I could just add a little bit more. I think in, in any application like this, you design around some 
level of acceptable escape, whether it's mercury or it's carbon emissions. And that's really the engineers and the scientists' roles to figure out how do we design it, essentially the, the strategies to move the materials and how to contain the materials so that the release into the environment is acceptable. But there is going to be some release. There always is. Just like with everything else we do, the cars we drive, for example, it release things in the environment. We cook things in our home, it release to the environment. We heat our home, release uh, emissions to the environment. It's all about controlling it to a level that's acceptable. And that's really where the technology comes in. Another air quality question is about the asbestiform minerals that is in the iron ore. And um, that would be determined by, um, I mean, that would be released during crushing and grinding, and uh, it would have to be controlled, monitored and controlled. And they do monitor and control for that on the iron range in Minnesota. So there are engineering controls that would protect the workers. Thank you. A uh, question for, I think this is going to be best started off by Mr. Donahue. Are chemicals used to extract the iron from the crushed rock in, a, in taconite production? And if so, how are these chemicals handled, stored, contained, and disposed of? I'm, I'm going to sound like an economist here, I think. <laughs> um, we're, we're actually getting into the uh, metallurgy of the uh, ore processing, which is really starting to get kind of beyond what, uh, what I typically deal with. Uh, but uh, there are instances where different chemical reagents could be used in, uh, in uh, iron ore uh, milling. Uh, I don't know enough about this particular deposit or what the strategies are to know if that's uh, even in play for this particular project. So that's about the extent of what I know. Thank you. And I apologize in advance for this question. Does the DNR have the human resources to perform their regulatory tasks in the allotted time? And what happens if they don't? Yes, we do. We um, actually have quite a few people working on the mining project right now, and we have assigned the best staff that we have in the agency from all of the different programs, whether it be wetlands, surface water, groundwater, my own staff in the Waste and Materials Management Program, a staff from all over the agency who will review things like forestry and um, threatened and endangered species, um, right down to our finance people who help us with the billing. And, you know, some of those staff are here with me tonight and we really did get the best of the best. And this is a high priority project because of its scale and its potential effect on the environment and we will make sure that we have it covered. It won't be a problem. Thank you. And also, if you hear your question and there's parts of it missing, it's because I can't read your handwriting. <laughs> My wife's a fourth grade teacher, and she would be disappointed in many of you. Um, it, the next question is for Craig. Are there other uses for some of the materials? I think you touched on this a little bit in your presentation. Um, the tailings, the waste rock. We're not talking necessarily about this site specifically, but what kinds of things do you look for in terms of other beneficial uses? There's lots of applications. It depends a lot on the creativity of the, of the engineers and the people who want to use the materials in other, other areas. We've uh, spent a long time at our Recycled Materials Resource Center on campus about doing exactly that, how to take industrial byproducts and repurpose them for other applications. So for example, in uh, building infrastructure, you know, sometimes aggregates can be used for uh, as a replacement for conventional aggregate in uh, Portland cement concrete, be an example. Sometimes we have cementitious byproducts that we can use um, in um, in cement-based materials. Uh, there's applications where people have used tailings with other types of uh, cementitious agents to create fill materials. So there's a whole broad variety of different applications. It uh, ends up being a matter of economics and uh, creativity. For the, um, for the people looking at using the materials. Thank you. For any of the panelists, um, I think I'd ask Steve to start this, if he would. In your experience, we talked a little bit about um, the energy demands of, of a project like a major um, a mi a mining operation. What are some of the ways that energy are supplied? Um, I wouldn't ask you to speculate about how it would be in this particular case, but um, 
at this kind of scale, how are, how are the energy demands met for a project like this? Well, there's, there's a number of options. One is just electrical power lines to bring in the electrical energy. Uh, oftentimes you might have a gas, natural gas requirements as well, so I uh, wouldn't be surprised if there's a natural gas pipeline feeding a project of this type. Uh, other options are to have on-site power generation, which could be uh, historically might have been something like a, a small coal plant uh, powering. Um, uh, in addition to that, depending upon the project, uh, we've been involved in projects where there's been on-site generators and things of that nature. Uh, that would be for some smaller mining operations. I would think something like this is probably going to be, you're, you're probably looking at some kind of a utility line coming in for electrical and, and natural gas uh, type source. I just want to follow up very briefly. I'm going to speculate because the economist gave me that idea. Um, <laughs> but just as far as, far as on-site power generation, um, not reading anybody's mind, but the capacity for cooling water would be, I would expect to be a limitation. Um, generally, larger power plants uh, are located near bays or large river systems, and, uh, and that's generally lacking from the area. Another factor in the water budget. I'm not sure anyone is, will be able to answer this, but I'll ask it anyway. From what we know about this type of a taconite mining facility, will there be smelting located on the site? And if so, could someone describe what's, what the smelting process entails? Uh, I don't think there's going to be a smelting process on site. The uh, taconite pellets will uh, almost certainly be shipped off via rail or some other mechanism to uh, uh, another use outside of uh, uh, northwestern Wisconsin. Thank you. This question is for Ann. Do the laws and administrative rules require the mining company or any mining company to use the technology and systems that Dr. Benson described in their, uh, in their mine plan? Yes. Um. When a mining company is designing their mine and the associated operations and disclosing their environmental impacts, if they, they can't get permits if they're going to have environmental impacts, so they need to design the facilities in order to avoid those environmental impacts. So for example, if a waste facility may need a liner and a cap and maybe even some treatment within the waste facility to you know neutralize acids if present so yes those technologies need to be utilized if if there's a reason for them and it really depends on the geochemistry and the ultimate operation of the mine Uh, just to add a little uh, addition to that, uh, one of the requirements under the, uh, under the mining law is that the applicant has to submit a feasibility study and plan of operation for any of these waste facilities that have been discussed. And uh, inherent in that requirement is that the applicant use a performance-based design process to actually look at the geochemistry, the performance of the containment systems as part of their engineering design and demonstrate in that application to the state that they're going to be able to meet the actual groundwater and surface water quality standards that are going to be applicable to the project. You know, I'll add that I was glad when Dr. Benson bragged about our landfill design criteria in the state of Wisconsin. And really, indeed, we are nationally recognized for our landfill and waste facility design in the nation and are relied upon by the Environmental Protection Agency due to our strong regulations. So um, what Steve was saying is, is true. There will be you know, the, maybe the biggest part of this project is going to be designing the waste facility. I'll just add just a touch on that. That process that goes into reviewing the engineering design that goes into those facilities is really rigorous. Having been on both sides of that process, both in the helping to review from an agency perspective and helping to do that analysis from a, a mining company perspective, it's exceptionally rigorous. In fact, it's, it gets to the point where it's almost painful, you probably see. Uh, it is that level of detail that goes into it, and the level of scrutiny and peer review is pretty remarkable. It's anything but simple. 
very briefly reflecting on Dr. Parker's uh, coverage of the price trends, um, and I welcome other opinions, but every control comes with a cost, and the, the larger controls can be larger costs, something that be, should be factored into consideration. Just so everyone knows, there's about a half an hour left in our program. If you need to leave, it is getting late. Feel free. Don't, you're not going to offend anybody here. Come and go as you need to. Um, I also wanted to comment on a number of the follow-up questions that we've received um, and some of the questions that you're, you're, the answers that you're hearing to your questions. Um, the folks that are up here really only have the information that they have right now. If, if we have this forum again in a couple years or a year, we'll probably know a lot more about this particular project. And I understand it might be frustrating to some of you as to some of our answers, but really that's um, getting into more than that is getting outside of the realm of what we really know, and we're trying to stick with that. Um, so please be patient with us. Um, this question is for Professor Parker. Can you comment more specifically on the potential effects of a mine in northern Wisconsin on tourism? Again, I, I, you know, I, I can't forecast exactly what those effects would be. I do know that there's a big literature in economics that shows uh, in certain parts of the country uh, more clear cutting of forests, uh, more mining, uh, especially open pit mining. Uh, these activities tend to deter uh, tourism sectors. Tour the tourism sector is very mobile. The entrepreneurs that work in that sector are very mobile. And, you know, it's highly competitive. And so uh, a diminishment of environmental quality in one place um, uh, could cause those entrepreneurs, those businesses to relocate. They don't have a lot of physical capital that's tied to the land. They have a lot of mobile capital. Um, uh, and so, so they can move around, and they do. Uh, you know, of course, the impacts of on the tourism sector depend on how strong that sector is to begin with. And so, to answer this question more carefully, we, you know, we'd need to know sort of what what the tourism sector looks like, where the tourists are coming from, what the trajectory of that sector looks like. Maybe even more important than its size now is how it's been trending. Um, but certainly, in areas where tourism has been trending up with there's been some kind of adverse environmental shock that that industry has responded that's pretty well documented in the in the um, economics literature uh, I mean, one thing that's also documented is just that population growth responds to quantitative measures of natural amenities which is a hard thing to measure quantitatively but you know economists have have tried to we try to measure everything and um, you know, population growth, retirees in particular, but uh, young people as well are pretty responsive to um, their perceptions of, of you know what natural amenities are like in a place and what the environmental environment is like. Thank you. Environmental environment. I probably won't see. Use they wouldn't that have again. noticed that either. <laughs> uh, for for Professor Benson, can you talk a little bit about how? leachate collected from a waste facility can be managed to minimize or eliminate potential harm caused by it? So leachate is the liquid that uh, is generated when um, water contacts some other solid material and then that solid material transmits some contaminant into that water. Take clean water and put contaminants in it, we call it leachate. And we collect that often at the, at the bottom of a facility. We have a drainage system and pipes and pumps that pull that out, and then we pull it out and we send it into the, the wastewater treatment plant. And these systems do have very large volumes of water that are being processed, and much of that water needs to be treated before it's discharged. And so that leachate that would come out of a, a, a tailings facility or a waste rock facility or some other uh, contaminant generating uh, process on the property would, would go into that plant and be treated and, and cleaned up and then released. 
and there's pretty stringent requirements on that process. So it's a, it's a standard wastewater treatment process once you collect it. And collecting it's not a lot different conceptually than the sump pump in your basement. Uh, one, one other aspect that'll, that'll be examined too as part of the overall water management, including uh, uh, treatment needs for that type of water, is also the potential for reuse of that water inside the mill. So any, anything to recycle, uh, reuse the water in the mill or the mining operation is also something that's looked at. Uh, that's to cut down on water demand in the first place, and then also the economic benefits of reducing potential treatment costs on the tail end as well. When you reuse it, the energy costs are lower, the reagent costs are lower, and that's a more sustainable approach. Thank you. The next question is for Ann. What is the current state of activity at the proposed mine site? Is bulk sampling underway? Um, what can you tell us about that? Um, bulk sampling was completed this winter, and those uh, bulk sample sites have been reclaimed and look good. So no bulk sampling is going on right now. There is also um, exploration drilling isn't happen, happening at this time, although we do expect to receive another license application for additional exploration drilling later this fall or maybe in the winter. So what's going on right now is that uh, Go Get Back to Hackenite has a lot of scientists out in the field collecting baseline environmental data. I think uh, Tim might have told me about 20 people are out there this week doing um, wildlife surveys, wetland delineation, stream work, sampling. Um, and while that work is going on, we also have our staff out on site um, overseeing some of the work, providing guidance. We're doing all the stream delineations because that's something that the Department of Natural Resources does. So we have staff on site almost every day and they definitely have site on, staff on site every day right now. So there's no, nothing mechanical happening at this time. It's uh, scientists in the field collecting the baseline environmental data. And could you also, uh, we had a follow-up question about, about our discussion earlier about water and the amount of water that would be needed to run an operation like this. Could you uh, tell us at what stage in the process can someone watch for that information becoming available for them to scrutinize in terms of how much water will be needed and what sources the, the proposal will, will seek to draw that water from? That again is up to the applicant when they start providing us that information. If it's prior to the formal permit applications and environmental impact report submittal, my guess is some environmental data will come in before those formal submittals come in. Um, in any case, they'll come in in the formal submittals and when we receive them, they will be made available to the public through our website, just like we've made all of our uh, submittals from Go Get Back to Aconite to us and all of our correspondence back available on our public website. And so timing wise, I'm not sure when we'll start receiving that information. But I hear you saying it'll be before you're asked to prepare the environmental impact statement. And I would also recommend anybody who wants to receive timely information on this topic, if you go to the DNR's website and you go to this, um, the site for this project, you can sign up for notifications. And really anything that they post or change on that website will then result in an email being distributed to everyone who signed up for that notification. I'm on that list and you learn about things much quicker than you otherwise would through the press, especially if you're really interested in reviewing some of the, or keeping track of the progress. The press really goes on cycles and maybe doesn't pick everything up along the way. Well, thank you for that plug. So that's called our Gov delivery system and we have it for all kinds of different things within the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources purview. So. Likewise, if you would like a recycling update, you can do the same thing. But if you go to our website, put in the keyword GoGibic, you'll get to this website and it's very easy to sign up to get these email notifications. I can say from experience, if you just go to their site and you say, I wanna receive every notification they send out, which is what I've done, you'll learn a lot if you have time to read it all. Uh, Dominic. I think this is a member of the audience who really wants to test the theory of your willingness to speculate. 
what you can see by the first two words of this question. Beyond economics, <laughs> what are the social impacts of a large-scale mine? <laughs> Use it in a sentence. Gary Becker, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist from Chicago, just died recently. And he, uh, he believed that everything was about economics. There's, there's no separation. Economics is intertwined with all social science, sciences. And so he was quite an imperialist, and so are many economists. So I'll speculate about this. Um, I, you know, there's, if you read the, the newspaper reports about the Bakken oil formation and fracking in North Dakota, you'll, you'll read about all the money that people are making, but you'll also read about the pressure on the local infrastructure. Um, you'll read about accelerating crime rates. You'll read about social disruptions that some people view as adverse. And, you know, and then if you go to the data and look at statistics, there is some evidence that um, places that uh, have a, a experience a boom, a natural resource boom, be a, a, big, a big fishery boom or a forestry boom or a mining boom, um, tend to have higher crime rates, um, deteriorating infrastructure. Uh, I mean, it shows up it shows up in the data in pretty pretty well constructed um, studies, and so so yeah, I think these you know there's there's a, a literature mostly in sociology looking at the differential impacts on women. How are women affected? Are they affected differently by a by a mine opening than men? Um, are children, high school kids, more likely to drop out of school? and invest in, you know, kind of a short-term plan of making money now at the expense of education that will pay off later on. So there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of research, and most of it's in sociology. Uh, it's unfortunate economists haven't done more here, because I think our skill set, especially empirically, econometrically, statistically, is, you know, we're good at, at measuring stuff, and, and so I hope to see more of more attempts to measure the impacts on health and uh, you know crime and things like this um, in the future. They certainly show up in media reports. Thank you. We only have time for a few more questions because I want to have time to ask the speakers to sum up um, their thoughts of the day. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask a couple more. This one of Professor Benson. It's a great test. You know, you, you got a difficult one to start out with, and then we gave you some softballs. So here, here, here's your last one. How can you say you know reclamation technology and other technology that you talked about will work for a thousand years when it is new and largely un, untested for a long period of time? Fair question. Fair question. How can how can we predict anything for a thousand years? Yeah. But we have to do that. You know, we have to make predictions about expectations for service life and life expectancy. And we do that all the time, actually, in all kinds of uh, scientific applications. Um, we predict things out in the fu future based on accepted principles that we know work in other areas. And we, we test those predictions. We predict something out 10 years or 100 years, and we look at data that supports it. And so. Um, there are well accepted techniques to actually do lifetime predictions. We, one of them we call Arrhenius modeling, which is a really well accepted technique in chemistry and physics to be able to extrapolate out degradation reactions. And that's one of the uh, techniques we've used to look at the lifetime of these materials. And, and then the other thing that we do is we look for other, to what we call analog systems, natural analogs that replicate what we're trying to engineer that are things in nature that have a similar type of chemical makeup or physical properties, and we look at how they've changed over time. We actually study that, and that's been the basis by which we've evaluated the service life of these type of materials. We've, we've done that through accepted uh, physical and chemical accelerated testing and predicting method, prediction methods, and then combine that with 
studying natural analogs that have the same chemical and physical principles behind them, but they've been in nature for many, many years. And we put those two things together, and that gives us a high degree of confidence. It doesn't ever give us the answer, but it gives a high degree of confidence. And we often look at trying to at least have two independent lines of evidence that point to the same answer. And if that's the case, then we feel pretty good about it. Nothing's for sure, but we can get a pretty good feeling that it's a reliable prediction. Thank you. I'm going to ask the, ne the last question next. And I know a number of you here probably will not have heard your question. A number of them got combined into general topic areas. And some of them were we had to weed out given because of time, and others because they asked great questions, but well outside the expertise of our panelists today. Um, and I know you don't want to sit here for two hours at at hearing them say, I don't know anything about that. So we did weed some of them out. And please be understanding if you didn't hear your question. Last question is for Anne. Under what circumstances would the DNR deny an application for a permit to mine in the Pinocchio's? There's probably many of them. Um, it, you know, I'm probably on this panel the least likely to speculate. You won't hear me doing a lot of it. Um, you know, I have to take great care in the things that I say because we have very little information at this time and we need a lot of information to make permitting decisions. And so I'm waiting for that information. So we're not going to approve a permit that shows that it's going to, um, unless it's going to meet the water quality standards that our state has and that, that the Bad River Tribe has. So that's the type of permit we could approve if it's shown that it can meet those water quality standards if it cannot show that, then we won't approve it. So that's one example, and it could be the same for almost every, envir every environmental media out there, whether it be surface water, groundwater, air quality, um, and the like. So it, we, we will need a lot of information and a very high quality application um, that shows that there's going to be very little impact on the environment in order to approve the permit submittals. That's the simplest way I can say it, but I, you know, there are probably many reasons why we would deny a permit application. It, it's harder to actually get the permit. Sure. Uh, if I could ask each of you to, if you have anything that you would like to say in summary tonight, and I'll maybe go in reverse order as, we, as to what we spoke to start out. So that would start with you, Anne, if you have anything to add and um, wrap up. Oh, I don't think I have a lot to add. I want to say that I think forums like these are very important, and I really appreciate all of the people who came out to listen and to become informed on such an important topic. This would be the largest scale development project ever in the history of our state. And I think that it's a project to definitely watch and be interested in uh, and follow. And I always welcome opportunities to be able to answer questions in a much larger format. But that said, you can always call um, us at the Department of Natural Resources. We're happy to talk with you. I do receive a lot of calls. Um, and that's very fine, too. So if you're you have burning questions and you want to give me a call or Larry Lynch or Zoe McManama, we're happy to talk t with you, but really appreciate these opportunities. So thank you for coming. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say a few words. Um, uh, yeah, I moved to Wisconsin 25 years ago because it was an environmentally progressive state. The people here were good stewards of their environment. And that was one of the drivers that chose the uh, reasons I picked my job here. Um, and I still believe that. You know, we're really leaders in the environment. And I think that what you see here tonight is part, important part of that process, that people are engaging in the decision making, that they're making their perspectives and questions known, and people have to answer them. And that's an important part of the process. That's a check and balance in the system that goes along with regulation, and it goes along with engineering. And, and so I think that having all three of those is really important and something that we need to continue to have and we need to champion. I also think we need to be pragmatic as well. We, we, we do use resources, uh, and uh, if we're going to use resources, then we ought to be thinking about, you know, we ought to be able to produce them here as well. You know, if we're going to buy iPhones and cars and all kinds of other stuff, well, we ought to be responsible enough to produce some of those raw materials that go into those here at home, and we ought to do it well. Um, so I'll leave it at that.
This is a test, by the way, to see if you can remember the reverse yeah. order of what. <laughs> right. So far, so good. Good, good. I was nervous there for a second. <laughs> um, I, I've got a couple things. Uh, one is going back to the question about the non-economic social implications of this thing, uh, these types of activities. And uh, what occurred to me as an ecologist that knows not, nothing about this topic um, is this. This is one of the effects. What we've seen over the last four years is one of the effects. Communities trying to understand what this means to their community, to their lives, to their, um, their value system, and what they want to see the future be. Um, and that, uh, throughout this discussion, we've, we've talked about very much like uh, Dr. Benson says, that we use these materials. And that's right. Um, there's no doubt about that. But the question looking into the future, when we think in that, term, that long time frame, is how are we going to keep using these materials? And to what extent can we look at recycling to uh, get some of these materials and, uh, and make sure that uh, future generations can live with some semblance of the quality of life we have because we haven't been borrowing from them using the practices that we developed the last century or century before. Um, and then lastly, just, just a soapbox, um, but it'll be a short one. Um, when we talk about decisions and how we'll know what will happen in the future and, and modeling and um, all those things, it's only as good as the data that goes into it. And uh, the decisions, everybody's ability, everybody in this, in this room, out in your communities will be making a decision, even if just for themselves, about what the future will hold. And it's only as good as the data that goes into it. So keep asking those good questions. There's some great ones tonight. Uh, I've been amazed at how engaged folks throughout Wisconsin and the Northland have been to learn for themselves what this means. Um, it's inspiring. It really is. Miigwech. Professor Parker. So this has been a great experience for me, and I appreciate um, being part of this. I, I don't spend much of my time uh, being out and about at, at, at uh, events like this, because I'm still untenured, so I have my nose to the computer, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm mostly communicating to other uh, ac uh, academics. So this is, this is a very refreshing change for me. Uh, there's there's a, a bumper sticker out there that presents a very old school view, pro mining view, and it says, the bumper sticker says, real wealth comes from the ground, it comes out of the ground. And I think it's important to point out, which I've tried to do, is that sometimes, and it's, it's not really paradoxic, paradoxical anymore, it's sometimes greater economic value talking about economic, you know, traditional economic value is generated by leaving that wealth in the ground in their natural state rather than extracting the resource. And I wanted to emphasize that point because I, I think it's one that's maybe not made enough and one that um, economists might not be appreciated for um, understanding, but, but really within the profession it's, it's pretty well accepted that economic value can be generated from natural undisturbed landscapes. With that said, you know, high paying mining jobs are a big deal. They open doors, they create opportunities for the people that have the jobs and for the jobs that are created by, by that too. So I don't want to minimize that. These are, are really tough trade-offs when you think about benefits and costs of, of potential projects like this. So I, I, I appreciate being part of the discourse and, and think it was, it was great, uh, very useful. A, a couple thoughts. Uh, one, uh, I work for a uh, engineering consulting company and I've been doing this type of work for about 25 years, um, almost exclusively on behalf of mining companies looking to get projects permitted through regulatory agencies like the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And I think a couple things. One, uh, and I think Craig touched on it before, uh, mining is important in our civilization. Uh, our civilization wouldn't exist, we couldn't sustain ourselves if we weren't mining things out of the ground. Our agricultural industry, our transportation industry, our healthcare industry, our infrastructure, we couldn't 
sustain that if we didn't uh, mine metal products out of the ground. Uh, so we need to do this. Uh, we need to do it responsibly. And we need to ask the question, does Wisconsin really have a good process for how they're going to evaluate these projects? Uh, and I think anybody can look at a statute and can look at administrative rules and they can quibble with them and certainly if you're looking at it from a mining industry proponent you might want to change things or if you're looking at things from a NGO's uh, standpoint you might want to change things but Wisconsin does have a very rigorous process uh, and it's very transparent uh, it's very open to public involvement like we're having here today and I think it's something that the uh, citizens of the state can feel confident about that when the state gets to a point of making a decision uh, that uh, uh, and uh, a decision say to permit a project like this uh, that they're going to permit it based on very good engineering and science that's going to underlie a decision of, of that type. Professor Fitz? Okay, okay um, a couple comments about the rocks and then about uh, the mine and possible impacts. Um, first, this is, a, this is a very large deposit. Uh, there's a lot of iron ore there. And uh, one of the interesting things about it is that 65 degree dip to the north, which means that if it were to be mined, the mine would be long and deep. Okay, so that's about the, the geometry of the deposit and the mine. Uh, in terms of um, potential environmental impacts, this what's proposed is, is a very large mine. And uh, so environmental impacts are inevitable. It would take an area that is relatively pristine right now and turn it into a, a mine and a large industrial area. So there certainly would be impacts at the site. The question really is about what are the air and water impacts and what would be affected uh, downstream. Um, and these are, these are difficult questions in terms of the, the science and what we need to know about the deposits. They're also difficult questions in our society because it's difficult to say what is an acceptable amount of environmental impact to live the lives that we live. And um, there is no such thing as zero environmental impact. So we struggle with this and we're struggling it, with it here in Wisconsin. And it's, this is sort of a microcosm of what goes on around the world in that uh, people need resources and jobs and there's a struggle between that and protecting the environment and, and having these resources and having um, healthy workplaces and a healthy environment for the long term. So these are difficult struggles and um, it's good that we are having these uh, discussions like, like this one and that uh, this gets us thinking about um, our communities, what goes on in our communities, and uh, our relationship to the earth and um, how we relate to um, our use of resources. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Susan to wrap this up, but before I do, I wanted to thank you all. I feel a little bit sheepish because at the beginning of this, I thought it might be necessary to ask everyone to be respectful, and I can see that maybe I jump the gun on that a little bit. I appreciate very much how respectful and um, attentive everyone was. It's not always the case in these public forums and it makes it very difficult for people who want to try to share uh, knowledge and information. So I'm very grateful for that. And I'm gonna turn it over to Susan for follow-up. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks so much, Attorney Larry Konopaki, for moderating this um, informative session. And thanks to all of our distinguished participants. Thank you so much. A lot of you came a long way away. Thank you.